and welcome to Relevant History. I'm Dan Toller. This episode is the fourth in a six-part arc covering the French Revolution. If you want to start at the beginning of the story, I'd recommend skipping back to episode 57, Bastille Day. This one will still be here when you get to it, I promise. Also, a quick reminder that Patreon memberships are now just $1 a month. For that, you get access to all 24 existing episodes of my video series, Dan's War College, as well as the relevant History Discord server. And by the way, I'll be releasing a new video this month, December 2023, as a thank you slash Christmas gift for my patrons. This $1 offer is for a limited time only. Sometime soon, probably next summer, I'll resume making new video episodes every month, and the cost for continued access will go up to $5 a month, although Discord access will remain just $1 a month. And if a Patreon membership isn't for you, please consider sharing the episode. It really helps grow the channel. Shameless self-promotion over. Let's get started. We left off last episode with the execution of Louis XVI. France is officially a republic, and the National Convention, the new legislative body, is dominated by two competing left-leaning factions, the Girondins and the Mountain. While the Girondins had previously controlled the convention, many had tried to stop Louis' execution, and the Mountain has gotten them expelled from the Jacobin Club and is now increasingly in control of the convention. Meanwhile, France is at war, and while the war had started out as a preemptive defense of the revolutionary government against Austria and Prussia, it's about to expand into a general European war called the War of the First Coalition. As I explained in the last episode, by late 1792, the revolutionary government has adopted two important policies. First, they're going to expand France to its natural borders, meaning the Atlantic and the English Channel in the west and northwest, the Rhine in the east and northeast, the Alps and the Mediterranean in the southeast, and the Pyrenees in the southwest. Second, they're going to spread the values of the revolution, the abolition of feudalism and establishment of republican government, to any border areas that they don't directly control. By the end of 1792, France has succeeded in most of these areas. In the southeast, the old feudal territory of Savoy has fallen, and its capital city, Nice, is in French control. And following the Duke of Brunswick's retreat into Prussia after the Battle of Valmy, French armies have snatched up all the small German statelets on the west side of the Rhine. This leaves one geographic area, the Netherlands, meaning both the Austrian Netherlands, modern-day Belgium, and the Netherlands proper. If the revolutionary government can control this area, France will be firmly in control of its natural borders and relatively safe from invasion. On November 6, 1792, while the National Convention is still deciding what to do with Louis XVI, French General de Maurier advances into the Austrian Netherlands and attacks the main Austrian defensive army at the city of Jemappe. The Austrians have occupied an imposing defensive position that 18th century French historian Jules Michelet describes as follows. Quote, 
The position is not only strong and formidable, but imposing and solemn. It speaks to the imagination, and anyone passing would certainly stop there even if they did not know that its name was Jemap. It is a line of hills before Mal, an amphitheater tipped at either end by two villages, Kusme on the right and Jemap on the left. Jemap rises onto the hill and covers a flank. Kusme is less easy to defend and was supplemented by several ranks of redoubts in successive steps. And in these redoubts were the Hungarian grenadiers. These redoubts and the two villages formed to the right and left as many citadels that had first of all to be taken. End quote. The French outnumber the Austrians by as much as three to one, with a force of 40,000 to 45,000 men against the Austrians' 14,000. Now, there's a military rule of thumb that says that an attacking force should outnumber an entrenched defensive force by three to one if it's going to be successful. And that plays out here. After the usual preliminary artillery duel, De Maurier's troops launch an attack on the morning of November 6th, but are repulsed. In the afternoon, they try again, this time attacking in a column instead of the traditional line of battle. This column reduces the width of the front line that's exposed to enemy fire. And once it punches through the Austrian defenses, there are plenty of men to attack to the left and the right and force the Austrians off the Jemap Hill and out of their entrenchments at Kusme. By evening, the Austrian army in the Netherlands has been entirely defeated. The massive French recruitment drive has paid off. With their superior numbers, De Maurier's less experienced troops have defeated a professional army and taken the Austrian Netherlands. This theme of mass French recruitment will play out again and again from now until the end of the Napoleonic era and will change warfare forever. So will the French tactics. In his book, 100 Decisive Battles, American historian Paul K. Davis writes, quote, Gustavus Adolphus in the Thirty Years' War, 1618-1648, had introduced the concept of a regular standing army that fought for its monarch, as opposed to the concept of armies of mercenaries, an approach that had been prevalent over the previous two centuries. Since his day, Small groups of professional long-term soldiers fought among themselves. After Valmy, not just armies but entire nations went to war. Soldiers fought not for pay or their king but for their nation, which from this point forward were nations of individual patriots. Nationalism arrived in Europe, and nothing would ever be the same. Militarily, that meant that the government could call upon the entire nation for personnel, and armies would no longer be small groups but massive hosts. Forces numbering 100,000 and more would soon be common as France introduced nationalism through its conquests and found that same nationalism rising up against them via conquered peoples. Fighting itself began to change, with more mobile artillery arriving on the battlefield and the standard attack in line giving way in many cases to attacks in column, whose striking power could punch holes in enemy lines. All of this meant more deaths, and sacrifice for one's nation became a common theme in public media. End quote. As Davis notes... France's enemies will soon counter their citizen armies with large citizen armies of their own. But for a while, at least, the revolutionary French have a huge advantage. 
It's also worth noting that the quality of their commanders is improving. Over the past few episodes, I've talked about problems in the French officer corps, with huge numbers of noble French officers going into voluntary exile and joining the émigrés. This has weakened the French army for the past few years, but by late 1792, early 1793, all of the noble officers who were going to leave have left. Anyone who remains is a steadfast supporter of the revolution, and these people form a base around which to build a new officer corps. These new officers, in turn, are mostly experienced NCOs, who were forbidden from becoming officers under the Ancien Regime because they're not of noble blood. Now free to command troops, these men bring much-needed experience to bear at a time when it's needed most. At the same time, the period of late 1792 through early 1793 sees the war turning against the French, although the revolutionaries themselves don't seem to realize it. As I mentioned in the last episode, the revolutionary government has grossly misread the situation in the Austrian Netherlands. Just a few years earlier, the Belgians had revolted against their Austrian overlords, and while the rebellion had been put down, the French see the Austrian Netherlands as a country ripe for liberation. But the Belgians hadn't been revolting against Austrian imperialism per se. Their revolt had been by noblemen and wealthy businessmen who were upset at Austrian liberal reforms. So when the revolutionary army comes in and starts seizing church property, abolishing feudalism, and forming local citizens' committees, the Belgians respond with riots and Belgian noblemen form their own little émigré clique that joins with the Austrians and the Prussians. The situation gets so bad that Georges Danton himself is dispatched in December as a special emissary, and misses a good chunk of Louis XVI's trial. Another problem the French are facing is the re-entry of Prussia into the war. In the last episode, we talk about the Duke of Brunswick's brief invasion of France and how he'd been forced to turn around in part because of the Battle of Valmy, but mostly because of a Russian invasion of Poland and the presence of Russian troops near the Prussian frontier. Well, by early 1793, Prussian King Frederick William II and Russian Empress Catherine the Great have come to an agreement. Russia seizes over 96,000 square miles of Polish territory. But Prussia also takes some territory. A little over 22,000 square miles that they get basically for free, including the port city of Gdansk. The Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth loses more than half its population and is reduced to a small, landlocked buffer state with Russian troops on its border. This event, known as the Second Partition of Poland, is finalized on January 23rd, and, with the Russian frontier secure, the Prussians turn their army around and once again march with their Austrian allies against the French. With all of this going on, you'd think that the French revolutionary government would avoid antagonizing any other European powers and take some time to consolidate their territorial gains. But this would go against their objective of securing France's natural borders, as well as violate the revolutionary ideal of spreading liberty. Remember, to secure what they consider their natural borders, the revolutionaries still have to deal with those pesky Dutch just to the north of the Austrian Netherlands in the actual Netherlands. 
Even if the French wanted to reverse course in January of 1793, they may already be in too deep. See, on November 16, 1792, the National Convention had declared freedom of navigation on the Scheldt River. The Scheldt flows north out of France, through Belgium, and while it only goes through a little bit of the Netherlands, the Dutch have used their control over the mouth of the Scheldt to cut off French riverine access to the North Sea, as well as to limit trade to the Belgian city of Antwerp and ensure Dutch trade dominance on the North Sea via the port of Amsterdam. The river has been closed to sea trade since 1585, which France recognized by treaty in 1648 at the end of the Thirty Years' War. The Scheldt has remained closed while Belgium was the Spanish Netherlands and while it was the Austrian Netherlands, with all parties recognizing the validity of the 1648 treaty. Well, Now the French are insisting that it be reopened to trade, which would enrich both France and the newly liberated Austrian Netherlands, which as of December 1792 has been declared a part of France. To enforce the opening of the Scheldt River, the French government is now threatening war against the Netherlands, which is probably a given anyway because of the whole natural borders issue, but the freedom of navigation crisis presents a convenient pretext. Unfortunately for the French, the Dutch have a powerful ally in the British Empire, which sees the Netherlands both as a route of access to European trade and as a necessary counterweight to the French. The last thing the British want is for France to control the entire British-facing coast of Europe, and that's exactly what will happen if the Netherlands falls. Up to this point, British Prime Minister William Pitt has tried to stay out of the French Revolution. For one thing, Great Britain is in debt from the American Revolution, and Peace gives the British plenty of opportunity to pay down that debt. For another thing, the British public has little appetite for war. Enlightenment liberals are happy with the French Revolution because they see it as a victory for human freedom. The British center agrees. Famous conservative Edmund Burke had written an attack on the revolutionary movement in France in 1790 called Reflections on the Revolution in France. Thomas Paine's 1791 rebuttal, Rights of Man, had outsold it by a large margin and ultimately gotten him expelled from Britain. But Even British conservatives have seen no reason to get involved. The apparent weakness of the revolutionary government and early failures of the French army had convinced most Brits that the French Revolution was a failed enterprise and weakened the French state. And anything that's bad for France is good for the British Empire, or so the thinking goes. But two things have happened. First, the French have executed Louis XVI, which is a bridge too far for almost everybody in Britain. Second, the French have taken the Austrian Netherlands and are now threatening the Netherlands proper. In modern terms, we would call this a threat to British national security. So on January 24, 1793, William Pitt's government severs diplomatic relations with the French government. The French don't wait for a declaration of war. The National Convention declares war on Britain on February 1, 1793, the same day it declares war on the Netherlands, with the Scheldt River controversy as a pretext for territorial expansion. 
A few days later, the Spanish government severs diplomatic ties with France. The Spanish Bourbon king, Charles IV, was already upset at the revolutionary government for executing his distant cousin, Louis XVI, but Charles IV is a weak and ineffective ruler. The real power in Spain is his wife, Queen Maria Luisa, who rules the country through her lover, Manuel de Gordoy, the Secretary of State. De Gordoy limits the Spanish response to Louis' execution to a diplomatic protest and tries to maintain neutrality even after cutting off diplomatic ties in response to the French invasion of the Netherlands. But then, what do you know, the National Convention declares war on Spain in early March. Portugal and Spain sign a defensive alliance, and now all of a sudden France is also at war with Portugal. Naples and Sardinia join the war in the same month, so now France is at war with Austria, Prussia, the Netherlands, Great Britain, Spain, Portugal, and most of Italy. Things are so dark that France is forced to turn to a third-rate power for assistance, the young United States. France and the U.S. are officially allied under the 1778 treaty that had brought the French into the American War of Independence. But the U.S. also has a policy of strict neutrality in European conflicts, and President Washington uses that policy to walk a middle road. The U.S. recognizes the new French government, but refuses to declare war on France's enemies. The revolutionary government dispatches an ambassador named Edmond Charles Guenet to the United States, and Guenet goes on a public speaking tour, asking for donations to build warships and trying to form a corps of American volunteers to come fight for France. He ultimately manages to build four warships, crewed by American privateers, which attack British shipping. These privateers start capturing British merchant ships and bringing them to the U.S. to refit them as new privateer ships. In what becomes known as the Citizen Guinea Affair, George Washington publishes a rebuke of Guinea's activities, which is co-signed by Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson and Secretary of the Treasury Alexander Hamilton. One of the few times Jefferson and Hamilton will ever agree on anything. Guinea responds with attacks on Washington in the American press, which is a foolish move because Washington is probably the most popular American president ever during his time in office, and public opinion turns against Guinea. With Guinea continuing to use the U.S. as a base for attacks on the British, a clear violation of U.S. neutrality, President Washington will ask the French to replace him as ambassador in late 1793. The French government complies, but by the time they do this in January of 1794, the reign of terror is in full swing and Guinea a Girondin ally, is on deck to be guillotined should he return to France. Now an ordinary civilian, Guinea asks Washington for asylum, which Washington grants him. Citizen Guinea eventually becomes an American citizen and spends the rest of his life in New York. Okay. So the French are at war with most of Europe, have no allies, and are invading the Netherlands. General de Maurier is enthusiastic, but as it turns out, the Netherlands is a really tough country to invade in this era. To the west is the province of Zeeland a series of peninsulas and outlying islands that would require complex amphibious operations, an insurmountable challenge for the French army. 
So de Maurier invades the eastern Netherlands and is instead faced with some of the world's toughest fortifications. Back in the 15 and 1600s, the Dutch had built huge star-shaped fortifications designed to be as strong as possible against artillery while creating multiple overlapping fields of fire for their own defenders. These fortresses are often surrounded by moats, with smaller fortifications in the surrounding area to further stymie any attackers. And as a small country with many potential enemies, the Dutch have kept these forts in good condition and upgraded them over the years. So, even taking the eastern route, de Maurier finds that the Netherlands is a tough nut to crack. On February 26th, after a week-long siege, de Maurier takes the critical city of Breda and plants a liberty tree in the town square. To his east, another French army is dug in around the city of Maastricht. This army is commanded by Francisco de Miranda, a South American officer who had served in the American War for Independence and who will later go on to become the first leader of independent Venezuela. Miranda has been outside of Maastricht since February 6th, and will remain there for another week until March 2nd. But March 2nd, 1793, is when it becomes obvious to even the most diehard French revolutionaries that they may have overreached. Remember how the French have taken over a bunch of little Holy Roman Empire statelets along the Rhine? Well, now that the Austrians have Prussian help again, they've managed to retake the cities of Worms and Speyer and are laying siege to Mainz. I don't want to get too bogged down here in all these little battles, so suffice it to say that this Austro-Prussian counterattack has driven a wedge between de Maurier's and Miranda's armies in the Netherlands and other French armies further east. In his book, Citizens, a chronicle of the French Revolution, British historian Simon Schama writes of General Miranda, quote, on March 1st, he heard that an army of 40,000, nearly twice the size of his, had crossed the river Roar behind him. Hurriedly dropping back and abandoning Maastricht, he fought a disorganized action on the following day. His volunteers were cut to pieces by repeated Austrian cavalry charges. By the end of the day, the French had lost over 3,000 dead and wounded to the Austrians' 40. Over the next week, de Maurier tried to repair what he euphemistically described to the convention as on a check, a failure. Leaving his expeditionary force in Holland, he concentrated on reinforcing Miranda's defensive position and taking dramatic action to reconcile the Belgians. Jacobin clubs were closed. Revolutionary decrees revoked. A fulminating letter of complaint sent to the convention. It was an exact rehearsal of Bonapartism, but it was too soon for France and too late for Belgium. Like Bonapartism, the politics of retrenchment meant nothing without military success. End quote military success will not be forthcoming. On March 18th, de Maurier has fallen back into Belgium and linked up with the remainder of Miranda's force. Rather than retreat further, he decides to turn around and attack the advancing Austro-Prussian army. After a successful initial attack, the French have taken control of the villages of Nierwinden and Hall, with a wide stretch of open ground between those two villages. The two forces in the Battle of Nierwinden are about equal in number at just over 40,000 men each. But the Austrian force is more cavalry heavy. 
With the French in command of the two villages, the Austrians launch repeated cavalry attacks on the open ground between them, which essentially divides the French force into two smaller forces and allows the Austrians to bring their infantry to bear first on one flank and then on the other. De Maurier is forced to withdraw in order to preserve his army, and the Austrian cavalry pursues the French, which turns a tactical withdrawal into an all-out retreat, and by the 23rd, the French army has almost been pushed out of Belgium and back to the French frontier. That day, March 23rd, De Maurier sends a message to the Austrians asking them to leave his army alone if he promises to march all the way back into France. The Austrians agree, and Du Maurier turns his army around. When the French Minister of War, a guy named Bernonville, comes north to investigate, Du Maurier turns him and his escort over to the Austrians. Now an all-out traitor, Du Maurier gives a speech to his men, urging them to join him in a march on Paris to overthrow the National Convention and restore the monarchy under Louis XVI's surviving son, Louis Charles, who the French royalists call Louis XVII. The soldiers, either pro-revolutionary professionals or volunteers, refuse, and on April 5th, de Maurier switches sides and crosses the Austrian lines. The loss of de Maurier isn't a big deal in and of itself. By this point, the French army has plenty of competent officers to replace him with. But when he goes to Austria with a few other senior officers, he takes with him Louis-Philippe Bourbon, the 19-year-old Duke of Chartres, who is the son of Philippe Egalité, the former Duc d'Orléans, and, as you will recall, Philippe Egalité is Louis XVI's cousin, the first prince of the blood who had allegedly supported the early revolution in a bid to seize power for himself and who had voted for Louis XVI's execution. Well, just a few days earlier, on April 1st, 1793, Philippe Egalité had voted with other members of the National Convention to summarily arrest anyone with, quote, strong presumptions of complicity with the enemies of liberty, end quote. As it turns out, the fact that his son has defected is enough to create just such a strong presumption. So, Philippe Egalité is arrested as an enemy of liberty, and thrown into a prison in Marseille, along with all the members of the Bourbon family who are still remaining in France. Turning back the clock a few weeks to late January and early February 1793, the National Convention is starting to deal with manpower issues. The 1791 volunteers had signed short-term contracts that entitled them to go home at the end of 1792. So just as France is facing a large coalition of enemies, its huge manpower advantage is going up in smoke. In December of 1792, the Revolutionary Army had 400,000 men in the field. By February of 1793, that number has dropped to 228,000. You don't have to be a math genius to understand that more enemies plus fewer troops on your own side equals big problems. The National Convention tries to solve this big problem in two ways. First, they aim to improve the quality of all of their troops, and second, they aim to raise more troops. The first measure, the improvement of troops, is called the Amalgame, and is approved on February 21st, 1793. Up until this point, 
The French army has been divided between long-term and short-term troops. The long-term professional soldiers, called whites, are more experienced, better trained, and form the backbone of the army. Their officers are appointed by the war ministry. The short-term volunteers, called blues, had been more numerous before most of them went home, but they receive less training. They also elect their own officers, which means that their leaders are often chosen more based on popularity than on actual military competence. To rectify this situation, the National Convention's military committee combines the professionals and volunteers by using a brigade system. Each half-brigade will include one battalion of professional soldiers and two battalions of volunteers, with a unified command structure and professional officers. The idea is to get those volunteers training and marching with the professionals, in the hope that some of that military professionalism will rub off. The military committee also raises the pay of volunteers to the same level as that of the professional soldiers in a bid to encourage enlistment. This system will pay dividends over the long term, with higher quality troops serving for longer periods of time and with volunteers performing significantly better in the field than they had previously. But the new system will also take time to achieve results. If you're a sports fan, you're probably familiar with the concept of a rebuilding year, where teams implement a new system, rebuild their talent, and make short-term sacrifices in order to build a competitive team in the future. A rebuilding year is fine for a sports team because you can always make that big playoff run next year. It's more problematic when you're a country at war with several enemies. Lose enough battles, and you might just lose the war before your new system has time to work. In the meantime, there is still the issue of manpower. To raise new troops, the convention institutes a levee, or draft, of 300,000 men. This new levee en masse, approved on February 24, 1793, has mixed results, mostly because of the way it's implemented. The convention sets a recruitment target for each of France's 83 departments, and the departments, in turn, hand down their own targets to each local commune. The communes, in turn, are responsible for doing the actual recruitment. The first tranche of troops are going to be volunteers, but the communes are also allowed to raise conscripts if necessary to meet their goals. So far, so good. The main problem is how the conscripts are to be raised. Now, I've never heard of a popular conscription system, but some systems are more popular than others. The last time the United States had a draft, for example, was during the Vietnam War, and it was done by lottery. Nobody wanted to get drafted, but if your number was called, at least you knew that the system was fair. It could just as easily have been your friend or your neighbor down the road, and the fact that your number was called was just bad luck. And even under this quote-unquote fair system, you still had people running off to Canada and burning their draft cards and all kinds of stuff to get out of conscription. Well, the local French communes decide to conscript people by vote. So what ends up happening when there aren't enough volunteers is that the commune sits down and chooses all the least popular men in the community to go off to war. Instead of choosing draftees based on physical fitness, aptitude, and their sense of patriotism, 
the local draft all too often turns into a way of settling local vendettas and squabbles. So if you happen to get drafted, you've most likely been chosen because your neighbors don't like you. Along with this, the convention allows the old practice of remplacement, or replacement. Basically, if you are rich enough, you can pay to have someone take your place, as long as you're also willing to pay for their musket, food, and clothing. So the same bourgeoisie class that's so overrepresented in the national convention and local communes is vastly underrepresented in the army. As is often the case in history, the people directing the war are not the ones putting their lives on the line. The levee of 300,000 has mixed results. In the northern and eastern departments that are most threatened by the Austro-Prussian armies, the local communes have no trouble finding volunteers. In much of the rest of the country, there are few volunteers and enforcing the draft is difficult. As a result, the convention is unable to recruit its goal of 300,000 men instead barely scraping together 200,000 new recruits over the following months. Beyond being a recruiting failure, the levee of 300,000 has deeper ramifications. For many in France, it represents the latest in a series of abuses by the revolutionary government. The Paris mob might be happy with the execution of King Louis, the expulsion of non-juring priests, and a war against France's neighbors. But as I've kept saying throughout the last few episodes, Paris is not France. Much of the country is rural and conservative, and for many of these people being asked or demanded to fight for a French revolution that they despise, this is the last straw. Throughout the French Revolution, there are a number of counter-revolutionary protests, riots, and outright uprisings. The spring of 1793 sees uprisings in Bordeaux, Cannes, Lyon, Marseille, and Toulon. While most of these uprisings are quickly put down by the revolutionary government, there is one region that will surprise everybody. The rural backwater called the Vendée. When I say backwater, I don't mean it in a derogatory way. But if you look at a map of France, the Vendée is about as out of the way as it's possible to be. Located south of Brittany along the Atlantic coast, the Vendée is, in the words of my fellow podcaster Mike Duncan, quote, not on the beaten path from anywhere to anywhere, end quote. Because of its relative isolation, the Vendée has so far managed to avoid the worst of the revolution. It's far from the northern and western frontiers, so the war is little more than a series of bad rumors. It has no large cities, so there are no urban mobs like there are in Paris. Not only that, but even within the Vendée, local communities are fairly insular. If you're familiar with the Normandy campaign from World War II, you've probably seen videos or pictures of French farms divided by thick, dense hedgerows. And that's the kind of terrain found throughout much of the Vendée. The landscaping reflects the local culture, with Towns and villages and their networks of farms mostly keeping to themselves, with minimal contact with each other, much less the outside world. The Vendée also has a different relationship with the Ancien Regime than most of France, meaning the relationship of the people to the nobility, the king, and the Catholic Church. 
We talked in the first episode about all the ways in which the Ancien regime was dysfunctional. But everything that was wrong in the rest of France has been working just fine in the Vendée. The local nobility are, by noble standards, poor. They don't spend most of their time in huge mansions in Paris, but live on their local estates within a few miles of their tenant farmers. Far from being absentee landlords, the Vendean nobility are active members of their local communities and are seen as problem solvers. Prior to the revolution, the Vendée had represented the ideal of how a feudal society is supposed to work, with obligations going in both directions between the classes instead of from the bottom up. A good example of this is how the Vendean nobles handle the hunt. In most of France, the Ancien Regime banned hunting for all except the nobility. In the Vendée, it's traditional for parish priests to announce the local nobles' hunting schedules from the pulpit and invite the peasants to take part. These good relations extend to the general Vendean attitude towards the monarchy. When the government is working the way it's supposed to, there's no reason to overthrow it. And when the revolutionary government beheads Louis XVI, The average Vendean peasant doesn't see the just execution of an evil tyrant. They see the murder of their divinely appointed father. The Vendée's relationship with the Catholic Church is also quite good. As you may recall, the pre-revolutionary French Church was rife with corruption. Bishops were not local men of the cloth administering a local diocese, but were the third sons of aristocratic families who needed a good-paying job somewhere. Most did not live in their diocese, and most squeezed the diocesan coffers for every last livre, leaving behind poor priests and little money for local charity. Once again, being a backwater has served the Vendée well, and local bishops are mostly local. If you're the third son of some pompous duke, you don't want to end up there. Your income will be low compared to other bishops, and there's no influence to court. So when the revolution comes in with their civic oath and anti-clerical policies, The average Vendean doesn't see the purging of a corrupt organization whose time has finally come. They see a bunch of godless Parisians attacking their local church and ordering their church bell melted down to cast cannons for a war they never wanted. Meanwhile, the imposition of juring priests has led to a variety of peaceful protests. Vendean citizens hide non-juring priests in their homes, even at the risk of having those homes confiscated from them, just so they can attend Mass in the woods with a priest who serves Rome and not the National Convention. Juring priests often arrive to their new parishes only to find the keys to the church mysteriously missing, the altar cloths and communion vessels hidden away, and empty pews on Sunday. In one village, the new priest's assistant refuses to help out at Sunday Mass, and instead goes into the bell tower to throw rocks at him whenever he comes near the church. In another village, Local women follow the new juring priest around the church, scrubbing at his footsteps, symbolically washing away the stain of his presence. To understand why the Vendée revolts, we also have to look at class conflict. Because while the local nobility and church are beloved, there's one group of people who are very unpopular with the local peasants, and that's the local bourgeoisie. 
There may be no major cities in the Vendée, but there are large towns and smaller cities with their own upper middle classes. And these upper middle classes have so far been the only ones to benefit from the revolution. For example, when the government seized church lands and sold them at auction, many farmers saw a silver lining. While the seizure may have been sacrilegious in their eyes, it also represented an opportunity to buy their own land and become independent farmers rather than tenant farmers. But what happened there is what happened in most of France. When the land went up for auction, people with money came in and bought it. And since those bourgeoisie have purchased church land as an investment, the first thing they've gone and done is raised the rent. When mass conscription comes to the Vendée, there's a final outrage. See, those same local bourgeoisie townspeople who bought up all the church lands are almost universally members of the local National Guard units. Because they're already serving in a military capacity, they are exempt from conscription. Instead, local communes, mostly run by bourgeoisie, will need to conscript peasants to fill their quotas. So far, the Vendée has remained peaceful, if only because, once again, it's a backwater and the revolutionaries in Paris have basically ignored it. We've seen those peaceful protests against juring priests, and there's a widespread women's movement where housewives are refusing to use the new assignat currency because it's backed by the value of stolen church land. These are powerful movements, but they're as far as the Vendeans have taken resistance so far. But with the levee of 300,000, the new government is now trying to force liberty on them at gunpoint. If you're the average Vendean farmer, the revolution has now gutted your local religion, executed your king, and made you poorer. And the local bourgeoisie who have enabled that revolution and raised your rent are telling you to go fight and die on the front and leave your wife and children at the mercy of fat cats who have escaped real military service by marching around town and play-acting in their fancy National Guard uniforms. This, along with all the other abuses by the revolutionary government, leads to the largest counter-revolutionary event of the French Revolution, the War in the Vendée. The War in the Vendée, sometimes called the Vendée Uprising, begins as a spontaneous series of local anti-draft resistance movements. In his book, Fighting the French Revolution, The Great Vendée Rising of 1793, British historian Rob Harper gives an overview of the opening days. Quote, On Sunday, March 3rd, large numbers of youths gathered in Cholet determined to resist the lottery planned for the following day. True to form, rioting broke out on March 4th, but was suppressed by a battalion of National Guards. However, the rioters gathered in greater strength and, although poorly armed, rushed and routed the National Guards. Although suffering around a dozen casualties, they had won and marched triumphantly north to link up with others. This success was soon emulated across the Mogé, with small numbers of Republican troops rushing to quell one disturbance only to find others igniting elsewhere. Uncoordinated pockets of trouble were spreading like wildfire throughout the region. The obvious targets were the main local towns, where lists of those eligible for conscription were held and where the lottery was to be carried out. Patriots were reporting gangs actively operating across the countryside, 
and Nantes was being inundated with urgent appeals for help, but had to prioritize its own safety when its communications were cut off both north and south of the Loire. Day by day and hour by hour, rebel numbers grew. Most were armed with farmyard weapons, but small numbers of muskets provided some firepower. On March 10th, the district of Clisson, between Nantes and Cholet, was in complete turmoil as rebels were gaining the upper hand. Around 1,000 men gathered in communities 12 kilometers southeast of Nantes and disarmed and expelled patriots. Recruitment was abandoned in communities near Machicol, as local rebels threatened to smash in the heads of anyone attempting to carry out the lottery. Machicol, defended by only 100 National Guards and some gendarmes, vainly tried to resist an attack by 3,000 rebels. On its capture, so Shu, one of the rebel leaders, systematically executed around 542 Republicans. Troubles now escalated significantly in Loire Inferior, as many towns fell into rebel hands, including Leger and Le Roux-Bottereau, and thousands assembled to oppose the authorities in Valais, 20 kilometers east of Nantes. By 11th of March, a small garrison had reoccupied Cholet and reported the toxin bell ringing across a wide area. On the following day, the authorities in Tifoge, eight kilometers west of Cholet, indicated that the whole district was in open revolt, and Chemillet, a similar distance to its northeast, was urgently appealing for help. During the night of March 12th to 13th, Chalon was evacuated by the local Republican authorities. The Comte de la Bouterie wrote, If you cast your eyes upon a map, you would see that the insurrection was running like a trail of gunpowder along the parishes bordering the departments of the Loire Inferior and the Vendée. End quote. So within ten days... A few local riots have turned into a regional insurrection. The National Convention scrambles to respond, well aware that such an insurrection, if properly organized, could prove a serious threat to the revolution. Despite the Vendée's distance from the war front, the war ministry manages to put together 45,000 troops and march them to the area. In the context of the war in the Vendée, these troops are conventionally known as Republicans because they are fighting for the French Republic. On March 19, 1793, we see the first major clash between Vendean rebels and Republican troops. A Republican column of 2,200 infantry and 200 cavalry is marching from La Rochelle to reinforce the city of Nantes, the largest city by far in the Vendée. It's been a rainy few days and the local rivers are swollen. After crossing a bridge, the Republicans find that the next bridge has been washed out and they have to hold up while some of their men make repairs. There's a dense fog in the air and dusk is setting in when in the distance, the Republicans hear men singing. At first, they expect an ambush, but as the singing gets closer, they can make out the tune of La Marseillaise. This relaxes them a little bit until, out of the fog, shots begin to ring out from all directions. It turns out that the Vendeans have made their own version of La Marseille with its own pro-royalist lyrics, which the Republicans had not been able to make out. The Republican commander, General Marseille, deploys his cavalry to guard the bridges while his infantry deploy. But somehow the Vendean rebels have already gotten between the two rivers, using some fords known only to the locals. Wherever a large body of Republican troops assembles, 
The rebels disappear into the brush, only to reappear where the Republicans are weaker and attack smaller bodies of men and supply wagons. Panicked Republican troops start seeing rebels in every dusky, foggy shadow and fire aimlessly into the brush. With his men's morale faltering, General Marseille orders a retreat beyond the first bridge and leaves a pair of cannons to guard it. They are ordered to fire grape shot, but they can't find any in all the confusion and are forced to fire ordinary cannonballs instead, which aren't nearly as effective as grape shot against massed troops. As the rebels advance on the bridge, they use a tactic the Vendeans will use many times. The men drop to the ground when the cannons flash. Then, when the cannonballs have whizzed overhead, they quickly jump to their feet and charge the guns to take out the artillerymen before they have a chance to reload. At the end of the evening, 500 Republicans lie dead, compared to only 250 Vendeans, and the Vendeans have captured the two cannons along with several wagon loads of ammunition and other supplies. Despite saving the rest of his men and salvaging an orderly withdrawal, General Marseille suffers the same fate as many defeated revolutionary military leaders. He is arrested for alleged cowardice and is guillotined in January of 1794. The Vendean rebels manage to capture another town, Borgneuf, on March 22nd, but are defeated the following day due to a lack of discipline. Basically, the men get drunk and celebrate, and are in no state to fight when the Republican troops counterattack on March 23rd. What the Vendeans need is leadership and discipline, and they will find it in the form of local captains. The rebel army, which comes to be known as the Catholic and Royal Army, is less a single army and more a collection of local militias whose commanders sometimes coordinate their actions. The army's regalia as such is generally religious. Their motto is for God and King, and the Catholic and Royal Army's official emblem is a heart with a cross on top of it, the traditional image of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. But the individual militias fight under their own banners, which sometimes bear the image of a popular local saint, and sometimes a picture of Jesus or the Virgin Mary. In his book, For Altar and Throne, the Rising in the Vendée, British traditionalist Catholic writer Michael Davies writes about the strengths and weaknesses of this army. Quote, The great advantage possessed by the Catholic army was its knowledge of the countryside. Their marksmen hid behind hedges, in ditches, in sunken roads, on banks. These marksmen were expert shots as a result of years of experience in hunting. They did not fire volleys in traditional military style. Each man waited for a target and took individual aim. Almost every shot that was fired found its mark. Blues by the dozen would fall without even knowing where the balls that killed them came from. When reproached for his defeat at Torfu, the Republican General Kleber replied, it is easy for you to talk, but those devils and sabots, clogs, fight as well as we do and shoot better. When the blues counterattacked, the whites might disappear into the countryside, only to appear again a few miles down the road. They would eventually attack, crying, Vive la religion! Vive le roi! And a furious hand to hand combat would ensue. In pitched battles, they would employ the tactic known as Le Grand Choc. Instead of advancing upon the enemy in disciplined ranks, they would break ranks and fling themselves upon the enemy, screaming out their battle cry of Rembar, Rembar, meaning rebuff. 
It is hardly surprising that the Republicans sometimes fled without resistance at what seemed to be a vast tide of steel sweeping towards them. Battles in which this tactic was employed were referred to by the Vendeans as shocks, the most famous being the Grand Shock of Chemillet on 11 April 1793. The great weakness of the Catholic army was its lack of discipline its tendency to drift back home after a victory. The Catholic and Royal Army sometimes numbered as many as 80,000 men, but within two or three days of a victory, the vast majority might have returned home. The soldiers had farms to manage and families to feed. They felt obliged to hurry back to them after a successful battle and would say to their commanders, Je dois changer ma chemise. I must change my shirt, meaning I must return to my family for a while. End quote. As I said, the Catholic and Royal Army troops get their orders from local commanders. The leaders are a mix of noblemen and peasants and tradesmen who all have one thing in common. They are pillars of their local community. This is both a strength and a weakness. On the one hand, commanders have the unwavering loyalty of their troops and can inspire them to heroic acts of bravery. On the other hand, when one of these commanders is killed or wounded, the entire militia has a tendency to run away. As the war in the Vendée progresses, the Republicans will eventually learn to target these leaders with disastrous consequences for the Vendeans. The list of leaders in the Catholic and Royal Army is a confusing mess, and I don't want to get too far into the weeds. Instead, I will detail two of the more famous men so you can get a picture of the type of people involved. Perhaps the most famous non-noble leader is Jacques Catalineau, a traveling merchant who peddles wares throughout the Vendée and is well known in many local communities. The 33-year-old Catholino had spent most of his 20s as a salt smuggler and had been sentenced to death when one of his companions beat a customs official to death. His mother had appealed to King Louis, who had granted him clemency and instead required him to serve a stint in the army. After that, Catholino had become an honest trader. He is deeply religious and has long been outspoken against the revolutionary government's anti-clerical moves, the execution of the king, and pretty much everything else in the revolution. On March 13th, he leaves his family and goes to the town square in his village of Pinin Moj, carrying a saber with a pistol tucked into a sash around his waist and a rosary around his neck. This image of Catholino will be immortalized later in paintings of the counter-revolution, as well as in the stained glass windows of local churches commemorating the events. Twenty-four local men join Catholino, and he marches them around to other local villages, soon amassing a following of 500 men, armed mostly with clubs and farming tools. With this ragtag force, he attacks the local Republican garrison at the town of Jalais, captures their weapons, and soon finds himself at the head of 2,000 men. Over time, this force will eventually grow to as many as 40,000 men. The other major figure I want to talk about is François de Charette, a 30-year-old Paris-born nobleman who has settled in the Vendée after a nine-year career in the French Navy, including a stint in the American War for Independence. Since leaving the military, he's mostly lived a quiet country life, although he was one of the noble volunteers who stood with the Swiss Guard at the Tuileries Palace during the August 10th coup. Like many of the noble leaders in the War of the Vendée, he doesn't initially seek command. 
As a military veteran, he understands how powerful the Republican army is and recognizes that the odds of a Vendean military success are slim to none. According to one story, a band of armed peasants come to his house to ask Charette to be their leader, and he hides under his bed to try and avoid them. When they finally convince him to come out, he first tells them to be sensible and return to their homes. Some of the peasants shame him for cowardice and remind him that he's an officer of the king and he finally agrees to lead them, but grudgingly. He says, quote, Very well then, if that's the way you want it, I accept, but you must accept my conditions. I will be the master, and when I command, you will obey, and I will break the head of anyone who does not obey. End quote. Like most Vendean generals, Charette has a distinctive style of dress. He wears a wide-brimmed black hat with gold bands and a large white feather, and underneath it he wears a white bandana with red spots. Without the hat, he looks kind of like a pirate or a motorcyclist. He likes to wear fancy green and blue coats into battle, and like Catholino, he wears a sash around his waist for his pistol. Unlike Catholino, Charette never leads more than around 10,000 men, and prefers to run his own operations rather than team up with other military leaders. There are exceptions, as we'll see, but in general, Charette recognizes the necessity of running a guerrilla campaign when fighting superior forces, and for that he needs a smaller, more nimble army. The opening months of the war in the Vendée are a string of mostly unbroken successes by the Catholic and Royal Army. Simon Schama writes of the Vendéans, quote, their tactics were impressively adapted to the particular terrain in which they fought. In the Lower Loire, for example, they used armed boat patrols to intercept both munitions and food supplies going to Republican garrisons. Windmills on the low hills of the Bocage were used to relay messages to outlying units by operating the sails according to a code of communications. And throughout the region, non-combatants, often women and children, participated by keeping farms working and supplying food and clothing to their troops. It was the kind of war with which we are now all too familiar, but for which the Army of the Republic, especially those troops who had been drawn from the battlefields of Belgium or the Siege of Mainz, was completely unprepared. Uniformed troops and disciplined formations were tied down in isolated garrisons, able to control large towns on the perimeter of the war zone, but helpless to patrol the interior, where every wood might conceal a murderous ambush, or to distinguish in villages between civilians and non-combatants. When the French generals who had fought in the Vendée discovered, to their dismay, Similar conditions in the Peninsular War in Spain 15 years later, they referred to it as La Petite Guerre, which in Spanish became rendered as guerrilla. End quote. This isn't to say that the Catholic and Royal Army has no successes in the battlefield. They fight several open battles and small sieges, and there are too many for me to go into in detail unless I wanted to do a whole series of episodes on the war in the Vendée. Suffice it to say that by the end of May, the Vendéan rebels control all of the Vendée except Nantes and a few small coastal cities. But instead of striking east towards Paris to overthrow the revolutionary government, François de Charette and other leaders remain in the West in an attempt to take the city of Nantes and regain total control of the Vendée. Their aim seems to be to strike north from Nantes, establish control of part of France's Channel Coast, and get help from the British. This is never to be. It's here at Nantes that the war will begin to turn against them. 
Nantes is an ancient city with medieval walls that have been partially demolished to accommodate suburban sprawl. It sits not far from the mouth of the Loire River, which is the main trade route from the Atlantic into the northern Vendée, and a series of bridges connected to islands across the river to the south. To the north, the suburbs spread across rising terrain that gives a clear view of the entire city, including the imposing and well-defended chateau at the heart of the old medieval core. Nevertheless, the city's Republican defenders are able to make the terrain work to their advantage. The roads into the city are sunken, so they're easy to block with barricades, while the defenders are able to build trenches and dirt breastworks to cover the rest of the perimeter. The south of the city, with its bridges, is particularly easy to defend, since all the Republicans have to do is block those bridges. The Catholic and Royal Army surrounds Nantes on June 19th and sends a demand for surrender which goes unanswered. The various Vendean commanders then wait for more troops to arrive and attack early in the morning of June 29th, when they outnumber the defenders by about 50,000 to 10,000. Charette, along with other commanders, is to launch a small attack on the south of the city in attempt to force the bridges, or at least to draw off significant numbers of Republican troops. The main force is led from the north by Catholino, again along with other commanders. Their goal is to attack across as wide a front as possible to spread the defenders as thinly as possible. The thinking goes that by spreading the defenders both from the north to the south and from the east to the west, they'll be able to punch a hole in the defenses somewhere, and once they get into the city, the overwhelming numbers of the Catholic and Royal Army will force a Republican surrender. The problem with this plan is that it requires a lot of coordination by forces that are semi-independent and spread out across a wide area. If the attacks come in one at a time, the defenders will be able to beat them back one at a time, and that's what happens. Charette attacks before dawn, while attackers in the northeast along the Paris Road don't start attacking until around 8 in the morning. Catholineau, in the northwest, doesn't begin his attack until around 10 o'clock. By this time, Charette's artillery have run out of their small supply of ammunition, and his men are launching sporadic attacks against dug-in defenders and artillery, with nothing to fight with but muskets and a lot of courage. It's not enough, and Nantes' defenders are mostly able to focus on Catholino's main attack from the northwest. Despite this, Catholino manages to punch through the defensive earthworks and get a few thousand men into one of the inner suburbs, where the medieval wall has been demolished and there's no major obstacle between his men and the city center. It looks as if the defenses are about to collapse and allow the Vendeans to enter from all sides. But then, disaster strikes. Rob Harper writes, quote, Catholino had already had two horses killed under him and was now fighting on foot. Surrounded by his most loyal followers and having made the sign of the cross, he rushed on the forces before him. Just at that moment, a bullet fired from a window smashed his elbow and entered his abdomen, causing him to fall to the ground, dangerously wounded. The shock of seeing their hero struck down completely changed the situation. In spite of his pleas and those of other leaders, the assault ground to a halt. The news of his fall spread rapidly and, Picking up their commander-in-chief, the Vendeans withdrew from the square and soon abandoned the suburb altogether. End quote. Charette keeps up pressure on the south of the city for another day, but without any corresponding attacks from the north, it's hopeless. 
Catalano had led around 40,000 of the 50,000 attackers, while Charette's force only numbers around 10,000. On June 30th, he's forced to withdraw. Jacques Catalano dies two weeks later on July 14, 1793, four years to the day after the storming of the Bastille. He's the closest thing the Catholic and Royal Army had to a single high commander, and following his death, the Vendeans will be more disorganized than ever, with a bunch of individual militia leaders each trying to conduct the war in his own way. Most of his family will be murdered in the series of Republican vendettas that follow. Although his son, Jacques-Joseph Catalano, will survive and will ultimately be knighted by King Louis XVIII. It's also worth noting that Jacques Catalano himself will be the subject of a religious campaign to have him made a saint of the Catholic Church. The campaign will make headway starting in the late 19th century but will come to an abrupt end when the records of the proceedings are destroyed during a World War II Allied bombing campaign. François de Charette will go on fighting and will become, in many ways, the new de facto leader of the Catholic and Royal Army, although more so as an icon than as an actual commander. As I said, his own personal command will always remain a relatively small unit, and he will always prefer hit-and-run fighting to the open battles that define 18th century warfare. We'll get back to him and to the rest of the Vendée in a little bit. For now, I want to rewind the clock once again, this time to late February 1793, I know this is a lot of back and forth along the timeline, but 1793 is a busy year for the revolution, and I want to talk about what's happening in Paris. Because while all this fighting is going on along the frontier and in the Vendée, the revolution is proceeding full steam ahead in the French capital. As winter nears its end, Food prices in Paris are getting so high that many of the poor are going hungry. Part of this is a result of normal supply and demand cycles. There have been food riots a few times already in revolutionary Paris, and they always seem to happen in late winter and early spring. But there's also a huge problem with the new French currency, the Assignat. Remember that the Assignat's value is backed by the sale of church land, and with the glut of church land currently on the market, the land has actually dropped in value, causing a corresponding drop in the value of money. But up until now, the Assignat has been kept afloat because foreign governments have accepted it as a valid currency for international trade. Now that France is at war with most of Europe and the British are instituting a naval blockade, foreign trade is drying up, taking the Assignat's value down with it. This is all happening while the National Convention is trying to fund a war. And they do what governments often do when they run into a financial crisis and have to pay the bills. They print more money. Now, I've seen various numbers for just how bad inflation is. Some sources that I can't really verify say that inflation reaches a peak rate of 3,000%. That's insanely high, and like I said, I can't verify it, but at minimum, the price of food has more than doubled in the French capital, while wages have remained stagnant. Before the revolution, the average Paris laborer had spent more than half of their wages on food, so a doubling of the price means that they are literally starving. Even if a laborer were to spend his entire paycheck on food, it wouldn't be enough to feed his family. 
On February 25th, 1793, the housewives of Paris, who do the bulk of the purchasing, take matters into their own hands. Bands of women armed with knives and clubs storm neighborhood shops, seize the food, and sell it to their neighbors at pre-inflation prices. Now, this isn't outright theft on the face of it, since the women do pass the money on to the shopkeepers, but it might as well be theft because it's not as if these shopkeepers are price gouging. Prices are up across the entire market, and now these shopkeepers have been paid less than it cost them to purchase the food in the first place, and many shops are forced to close, which only exacerbates the situation. Much like previous unrest, a lot of the trouble in Paris starts in the poor and populous Cordelier district. In 1793, the Cordelier leadership has taken a turn even further to the political left, in large part because their previous leaders have been so successful. Georges Danton, Jean-Paul Marat, and other members of the Cordelier Club are now sitting in the National Convention. And this has created a power vacuum and elevated an even more radical clique of new leaders that many historians describe as proto-Marxists. That's actually not far off. The only reason they're not called communists is that Karl Marx hasn't even been born yet, and the word communism hasn't been invented. But... They're calling for the redistribution of wealth to the poorer classes, and for adding a right to live to the new constitution. A right that would amount to the rights to food and shelter, provided at the expense of wealthier citizens. This new crop of leaders is collectively known as the enrage, meaning the angry ones, but often translated as the madmen. I don't want to get too far into the weeds here, but much like the leadership of the Vendée rebels, it's worth taking a look at a couple of leaders to illustrate the type of people we're dealing with. The first of these leaders is a Roman Catholic priest named Jacques Roux. Roux was the pastor of a Paris church prior to the outbreak of the revolution, and quickly started preaching in the streets to crowds of sans culot. He's taken the civic oath, and in 1791 had been elected as a member of the Paris Commune. As early as April 1792, he'd begun calling for the redistribution of aristocratic land, a free public grain dole, and for the execution of any citizen caught hoarding food. The other major leader I want to introduce is Claire Lacombe. Lacombe is a former actress who had come to perform in Paris in early 1792. She had been one of the few women to participate in the coup of August 10, 1792, and had been shot in the arm during the storming of the Tuileries Palace. She's a member of the Cordelier Club, and had been one of the instigators of the February 25th food riots. In May, she will go on to found the Society of Revolutionary Republican Women, an organization that fights not just for radical left political positions, but also for the full equality of women in French politics. Incidentally, she's one of the few Cordelier Club members who will survive the revolution and will live until 1826, although she will spend the last five years of her life in an insane asylum, most likely due to complications from syphilis. Despite the enrage's calls for redistribution of wealth, the National Convention is not ready to go that far to the left. Remember, most of their members, even former Cordelier Club members, are upper middle class, and as such they believe firmly in the right to private property. On March 10, 1793, the National Convention votes on re-establishing the Revolutionary Tribunal, which had been suspended at the beginning of the trial of Louis XVI. 
As you may recall, the Revolutionary Tribunal is authorized to arrest, try, and judge any French citizen for any reason, acting as judge, jury, and executioner. This is generally considered the moment when the left-leaning mountain takes control of the convention from the center-left Girondins. Ostensibly, the tribunal is going to be re-established to discourage counter-revolutionary activities, and the Girondins vote against it for two reasons. First, they fear that it could be used to target their own delegates, and second, it seems like another measure that will favor Paris over the more conservative provinces. The delegates from the mountain and their allies vote for the measure, not just to discourage counter-revolutionary activities, but to defang the enragés by preempting any future mob actions. Georges Danton gives the decisive speech that wins the vote for the mountain and reestablishes the Revolutionary Tribunal. He says, quote, I summon all good citizens not to leave their posts. Let this assembly not depart without having pronounced on the public well-being. The safety of the people demands great methods, terrible measures. Since some have ventured in this assembly to recall the bloody days that made any good citizen to groan aloud, someone had shouted September, I will say for myself that if a tribunal had then existed, the people who have been so cruelly reproached for those journeys would not have drenched them in blood. I will say, and I have the assent of all who were witness to those events, that no human power was in a position to stem the outpouring of national vengeance. Let us learn from the mistakes of our predecessors. Let us do what the Legislative Assembly failed to do. Let us be terrible so as to dispense the people from being so. Let us organize a tribunal. Not well, that is impossible, but the best we can so that the sword of the law may be poised over the heads of all its enemies. End quote. At this point, I want to fulfill a promise I made back in episode 57 at the beginning of the story of the French Revolution. Back then, I said I would introduce Maximilien Robespierre when the time was ripe. And now it's time. I've waited because Robespierre is one of the most controversial men, not just in the French Revolution, but in all of history. To some, he's the embodiment of the Enlightenment, and a hero to all freedom-loving people. To others, he's the devil. Of course, Robespierre is neither an angel nor the devil, just a man. His life is like a Greek tragedy, by which I mean that his greatest virtues are the very things that lead to his downfall. He begins his career by earning the nickname the Incorruptible because of his consistent stands on unpopular issues. Of course, no human being is incorruptible. Everyone has a price, be it Money, fame, love, or, in Robespierre's case, power. His story should be a warning to anyone who thinks that the world would be better if only they were in charge. Inside each of us is a tiny Robespierre ready to explode like an alien chestburster and destroy everyone around us. And that's why I think it's so tempting to demonize people who do evil things. It's comforting to think of Hitler or Stalin or Genghis Khan as some other species made of different DNA than the rest of us. And the alternative is frightening. If Robespierre is just a human being like you and me, well, then we are also in danger of becoming monsters. 
Maximilien Robespierre is born in 1758 in the city of Arras, located near the Dutch border in the province of Artois. He's the son of a prominent local lawyer, and his mother is the daughter of a brewery owner. His birth itself is somewhat of a scandal in the conservative city since his mother is five months pregnant at the time of his parents' wedding. When he's six years old, Robespierre's mother dies in childbirth, and his father starts taking long business trips, probably to avoid the grief of spending time with children who remind him so much of his dead wife. Regardless of the reasons, his father's absence means that Robespierre needs a new guardian, and he's sent to live with his maternal grandparents along with his younger brother, Augustin, separating them from their two sisters. Although he spends most of his childhood living at his grandparents' brewery, the young Maximilien Robespierre decides to follow in his father's footsteps and study the law. He spends three years at the local college in Arras, then earns a scholarship at the University of Paris, France's most prestigious university. There, he excels as a student and becomes a great fan of famous classical orators like Cicero and the classical Republican virtues. He also becomes enamored with the philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and although the story that he meets Rousseau in person is a myth, he absorbs Rousseau's obsession with personal virtue. He is also chosen out of 500 total students to give an honorary speech at Louis XVI's coronation when he's only 17 years old. Upon graduation, he earns a prize of 600 livres for academic achievement and good character, and in 1781 he passes the bar exam. Robespierre earns a spot as one of Arras's criminal judges, but he resigns less than a year later. Ironically, he resigns because he's staunchly opposed to the death penalty and is unwilling to condemn people to execution. He spends the next several years representing criminal defendants who are too poor to afford a lawyer, as well as publishing a number of respected political works. He publicly denounces not just the death penalty, but also slavery, gender inequality in the academy, and laws against inheritance rights by illegitimate children. All of these things are very unpopular causes at the time. One might call them fringe. In early 1789, mere months before the calling of the Estates General, he represents a soldier who has returned home only to find himself cut out of a wealthy uncle's inheritance. When the soldier sues, the rest of the wealthy family purchases a lettre de cachet, which, if you'll remember from earlier episodes, is a royal decree to imprison someone indefinitely without trial, so the soldier is locked up. Robespierre writes a letter to King Louis asking for the young man's release arguing that his imprisonment is unjust, as are letters de cachet in general, since laws should be applied equally in all cases. He says in part, quote, To lead men to happiness through virtue, and to virtue by legislation founded on eternal principles of justice, and so framed as to restore human nature to all its rights and all its dignity, to renew the immortal compact that is to bind man to his creator and to his fellow citizens, by removing all the causes of oppression that now create throughout the world fear, distrust, meanness, selfishness, hatred, and cupidity, behold, sire, the glorious mission to which you are called. End quote. When the estates general are called, Maximilien Robespierre runs an unusual campaign to represent the Third Estate. He calls the entire election process unfair, since representatives are to be chosen by electors rather than directly by the populace. Such is his reputation in Arras that the electors choose him anyway. 
Shortly afterwards, the Comte de Mirabeau will famously say of Robespierre, quote, This young man will go far. He believes everything he says. End quote. So far in our story, Robespierre has mostly stuck to his principles. He steered clear of the Paris riots, refusing to engage in violence in the belief that words and reason should decide the future of France. He's opposed to the war, on the basis that war often produces tyrants. And on the one occasion that he's supported the death penalty, in the case of Louis XVI, he's supported it because he believes it to be the will of the French people, which, according to his own principles, ought to be the highest power in the land. Now, in March of 1793, he stands beside Georges Danton calling for terror. But even as he slowly turns away from his own principles, his justification is unique among the French revolutionaries. He believes that in order to govern themselves, a people need first to be paragons of personal virtue, and that virtue can be imposed at the point of a bayonet. In February of 1794, Robespierre will write, quote, If the basis of popular government in peacetime is virtue, the basis of popular government during a revolution is both virtue and terror. Virtue, without which terror is baneful. Terror, without which virtue is powerless. Terror is nothing more than speedy, severe, and inflexible justice. It is thus an emanation of virtue. It is less a principle in itself than a consequence of the general principle of democracy, applied to the most pressing needs of the fatherland. End quote. Now, I need to be clear that we are not yet at the beginning of the infamous reign of terror. That won't start until September. Nonetheless, some unlucky folks are about to get their heads chopped off. From this point on, the tribunal will begin executing real and imagined counter-revolutionaries, albeit at a slow pace. Between March and September, it will execute 66 people, enough to put fear into the hearts of would-be enemies of the Republic, but a far cry from the thousands who will soon be slaughtered in the Reign of Terror. While the National Convention is debating the re-establishment of the Revolutionary Tribunal on March 9th and 10th, the Paris sans culot are once again making themselves heard. Mobs directed by the enragés are calling for the purging of all deputies who voted for anything other than immediate execution in the trial of Louis XVI. They fail in this goal if only because the delegates of the mountain are aware that they too would be in danger if the convention's delegates can face immediate recall should they upset the mob. However, the mobs also go around Paris smashing the printing presses of several Girondin newspapers, most notably Jacques-Pierre Brissot's Patriot Francais. This action, and the fact that the Mountain's delegates are silent on the issue, sends a clear message to the Girondins. Your days are numbered. The Girondin delegates have one last card to play, though. Almost immediately after the re-establishment of the Revolutionary Tribunal, they successfully bring three major mountain politicians to trial. These are Georges Danton, Jacques Hiver, who we haven't met yet, and Jean-Paul Marat. We'll get to each of these trials in turn, but let's start with Danton. Near the end of March a group of Girondin delegates bring Danton up on charges of treason. Remember, Danton had been dispatched to the north during General de Maurier's campaign in Belgium in order to help keep order. Upon his return to Paris, 
Danton had defended de Maurier's campaigns to the convention mere days before the general had defected to the Austrians. This gives the Girondins cover to bring him up on charges of high treason. They claim that he was aware of de Maurier's plots to defect, and that the general and other royalists had bribed him into silence. Danton's defense is brilliant. On the first day of his trial, he says he does not know why these charges are being brought, but promises to get to the bottom of it and punish those responsible. This tactic is designed to pique people's interest and plays as much to the passions of the spectators in the gallery as to his fellow delegates. I'm not going to relitigate the whole thing here, except to say that Danton's activities on the frontier were indeed murky. For example, it's true that he was in communication with emigres, although the communications themselves have not survived. So is Danton a traitor, playing both sides of the revolution? Or is he a pragmatist who had reached out to emigres in the hope of bringing them back into the fold? We'll never know for sure. Oh well. In his book, The Giant of the French Revolution, British author David Laude gives an account of Danton's closing argument, taken from the National Convention's transcript and with a few notes appended. Quote, the closing stages of Danton's marathon riposte on April 1st produced the grandest, ugliest piece of theater the convention had yet witnessed. The Girondin leaders left it to a tenacious lawyer, Mark David Lesource, a deliberate speaker, to set out their side's treason case against him. And for good measure, Lesource threw in the old accusation that never ceased to rile Danton, that he wanted to be king. Here the transcript begins. Lesource says, Here is my argument. I say a plan was made to restore the throne and de Maurier was behind that plan. What was required to make it work? That de Maurier be kept at the head of the army. Danton has been at the rostrum singing the praises of de Maurier, and here Danton interrupts, That is false! Shouts of false, lies from the mountain. The source continues, I demand then, in order to prove to the nation that we shall never capitulate before a tyrant, that each one of us here swear death to any man who would try to make himself king or dictator. Unanimous applause. Members stand shouting, yes, yes, placing hands oathwise across their chests. A Girondin voice says, Fabre, Danton's friend has proposed a king, and Danton interrupts. This is vile rubbish. You have defended the king, and now you cast your crimes upon us. Uproar. The president tries in vain to intervene. Le Source says, I demand that Danton be heard, and I assure you that I speak without passion. Danton, bounding to the rostrum, eyes turned to the left of the chamber. Citizens of the mountain, you have been a better judge than I. For I have long thought that however impetuous my character, I must temper the weapons nature has bestowed on me. That in the difficult circumstances in which my mission has placed me, I should employ the moderation I presumed events called for. You have accused me of weakness, and you were right. I admit it before all France. For our task is to denounce those who through rashness or villainy always wanted the tyrant to escape the sword of justice. Well, here are those men, swings to the right amidst violent protests from that side. Yes, citizens, the same men who today assume the insolent role of accusers. Why do I abandon my course of silence and moderation? Because there is a limit to prudence. Because when you are attacked by those who ought to applaud your circumspection, you have the right to attack in turn and to lose all patience. And here a Girondin voice interrupts. Don't talk so much. Answer. Danton says, I want a king. 
Only those stupid enough, craven enough to want to accommodate a king, can be suspected of wanting to restore the throne. Only those who have clearly wanted to punish Paris for its civil courage, to rouse the provinces against it. Huge commotion. Members rise, pointing at the Girondins. And Marat interjects, and their little suppers. And Danton says, only those who had secret suppers with de Maurier when he was in Paris. And then Marat says, La Source, La Source was one of them. I shall denounce all the traitors. And Danton continues, yes, they alone are accomplices in conspiracy. And it is me they accuse. Me. Well now. I say that there can be no truce between the mountain, between the patriots who wanted the death of the tyrant, and the cowards who have defamed us in all France in their effort to save him. We shall save the fatherland. And a Girondin voice shouts out, Cromwell, in reference to the former English parliamentarian dictator Oliver Cromwell, and Danton says, What rascal calls me Cromwell? I cite you before the nation. Cries from the left for the culprit to be thrown into the abbey prison. Yes, I demand that the foul mouth who has the gall to call me Cromwell be punished. To the abbey with him. A hush as Danton strikes a calm pose about to finish. I have taken my position in the citadel of reason. I shall come forth with the cannon of truth and pulverize the villains who accuse me. And here the transcript ends. The trumpet blast finale brought Montagnards and citizens of the marsh surging to his side. They embraced him, struggling mightily to lift his ox frame to their shoulders. Robespierre, too, would have joined the celebration in his manner, smiling a thin smile extending an arm in tribute. Was he playing over to himself Danton's public admission that he, Robespierre, scourge of moderates, was the better judge of things? The admission pleased him. End quote. Danton is quickly acquitted of treason, and the vote isn't even close. Within the week, on April 6, 1793, the Mountain capitalizes on their victory and establishes the Committee of Public Safety. This is a nine-member committee, although the number of members will fluctuate throughout its existence, and it functions as a kind of shadow government. It takes over the executive function vacated by the king without which the French state has been slow to act on anything since any type of action has required an act of the National Convention, which in turn has required contentious debates. By a two-thirds vote, the committee can direct the government's ministers to do anything it wishes. Danton himself is appointed as head of the Committee of Public Safety, and five of the other members are members of the Mountain while the other three are members of the Plain who have recently allied with the Mountain. In their book, The Age of Napoleon, The Story of Civilization, Volume 11, American historians Will and Ariel Durant write, quote, It was a war cabinet. It must be viewed not as a civil government acknowledging constitutional restraints, but as a body legally authorized to lead and command a nation fighting for its life. Its powers were limited only by its responsibility to the convention. Its decisions had to be submitted to the convention, which in nearly all cases turned them into decrees. It controlled foreign policy, the armies and their generals, the civil functionaries, the committees on religion and the arts, the secret service of the states. It could open private and public correspondence. It disposed of secret funds, and through its own representatives on mission, it controlled life and death in the provinces. It met in the rooms of the Pavillon de Flore, between the Tuileries and the Seine, and gathered for conference around a green cloth-covered table, which for a year became the seat of the French government. End quote. 
The representatives on mission the Durants are talking about are delegates from the National Convention who are sent out to France's departments to oversee the war, the draft, and various revolutionary reforms. They pressure local departmental assemblies to toe the line and report back to the National Convention. Some of these representatives had been sent to the war front way back on March 9th, but under the Committee of Public Safety's new orders, there is a representative on mission in virtually every French department. This helps the delegates of the mountain to increase their control over the provinces, which further angers the Girondin delegates. However, because the representatives on mission are drawn exclusively from their mountain and their allies in the plain, sending out 82 such representatives has another effect. The absence of those delegates temporarily swings the balance of power in the National Convention back towards the Girondin side. Two weeks after the establishment of the Committee of Public Safety, the Girondins propose and win a vote to have Jean-Paul Marat brought in front of the Revolutionary Tribunal on charges of inciting violence against members of the National Convention. The 19-page indictment is made up almost entirely from pages of his newspaper, in which he is openly called for the execution of Girondin leaders as, quote, criminal accomplices of royalty, end quote, and, quote, enemies to all liberty and equality, end quote, and where he has also called for a revolutionary dictatorship. Several of the Mountain's delegates even vote for the indictment, given the incendiary tone of Marat's journalism, which has made him an easy target. He's also a powerful target, since he's recently been elected as the president of the Jacobin Club. However, this prosecution turns out to be another miscalculation on the part of the Girondins. Once again, they have not accounted for the Parisian citizens and the radical Paris Commune. Simon Schama writes, quote, After eluding the police for three days, Marat finally turned himself in and was given a large room in the Conciergerie, where he received deputations of officials of the Commune and other citizens all eager to pledge their loyalty to the persecuted friend of the people. On entering the courtroom on the 24th, he was greeted with a storm of cheering from assembled spectators, which periodically burst out again, so that Murat had to ask his own supporters for quiet. He defended himself with great agility and conviction, claiming, not altogether disingenuously, that many of the apparently incriminating passages had been taken out of context that he had never preached murder and pillage, but had argued for energetic measures to avoid precisely those evils, that he had not called for the dissolution of the convention, but had said that the assembly would stand or fall by its own deeds and utterances. The judges, though approved by the Girondins in March, were plainly sympathetic to the accused, and the public prosecutor, a relative of Camille de Moulin named Fouquier Tinville, was less than zealous in his interrogation. They also concurred with Marat's arguments that his denunciations had been righteous and patriotic, and for that matter, generalized in their targets. End quote. When Marat is acquitted, his followers crown him with a laurel wreath in a symbol reminiscent of Caesar's crown. They parade him around the city, and when the Jacobin Club holds a festival in his honor on April 26th, there are so many people that one of the benches collapses under their weight. It's worth noting that Marat is the first member of the National Convention to be tried by the Revolutionary Tribunal. Prior to this, members of the Convention could only be tried by the Convention itself, but the Girondins had set aside this rule on the pretext that Marat had abused his immunity as a member of the convention. Very soon, this rule change will come back to haunt the Girondins in a big way. 
Already on April 15th, an angry crowd of sans culottes had picketed outside the convention, calling for the arrest of 22 leading Girondins for the crime of felony against the common people. Those sans culottes are not going away any time soon. On May 1st, 1793, a deputation arrives in Paris from one of the inner suburbs, demanding that the government set controls on the price of food. Furthermore, this same deputation demands an additional income tax on the rich to subsidize food costs, as well as the immediate conscription of all rich citizens into the army. Ironically, price controls had been common under the Ancien Regime, and had achieved disastrous results. Now, everyone in the National Convention knows that price controls are a bad idea, but the Girondins argue against them most forcefully. How is the Convention to determine a fair price? If they set the ceiling too low, everyone will run out and buy food all at once, farmers will be bankrupted, and the situation will only get worse. If they set the ceiling too high, farmers and merchants will collude to set their prices at the maximum and food will cost more than it should. As for the old conspiracy theory that wealthy speculators are hoarding food, Girondin delegate Jacques Cruz Latouche famously says, quote, These words hoarders and monopolies are only the dangerous visions of foolish persons and ignorant women. End quote. Here, the delegates of the mountain find an easy way to improve their popular standing. And they don't even have to give in to all of the populist demands. On May 4th, they force a vote to pass a national price cap on flour and grain, leaving other foods unregulated, imposing no new taxes, and not conscripting the rich. The measure passes, simultaneously giving the protesters a fraction of what they had demanded and making the Girondins once again look like the bad guys. This new price control will come to be known as the first maximum because it isn't the last time the National Convention will regulate market prices. In the short term, the first maximum has beneficial results. Poor laborers can afford to feed their families. But in the long term, as we'll see, the outcome is disastrous. Many farmers are forced into bankruptcy, while others illegally sell their grain on foreign markets in order to obtain a fair price. This will soon translate into more food shortages on the home front, along with an increase in smuggling. Anyway... The Girondins aren't quite done yet. See, behind most of the sans culot mob actions lies the Paris Commune, the local city government made up entirely of leftist agitators who had overthrown the old government in 1792 and instigated the August 10th coup. Now certain mountain delegates are inciting them to attack the Girondins head-on. In an April 8, 1793 speech at the Jacobin Club, Robespierre says, quote, You have everything you need in the laws to exterminate our enemies legally. If there are aristocrats in the sections, expel them. If liberty needs rescuing, proclaim the rights of liberty and put your whole energy into it. You have an immense people of sans culot, utterly pure and vigorous, who cannot leave their work. Have them be paid by the rich. I ask the sections to raise an army large enough to form the colonel of a revolutionary army that will draw all the sans culot from the departments to exterminate the rebels. I ask the Commune of Paris to support with all its power the revolutionary zeal of the people of Paris. I ask the revolutionary tribunal to do its duty and punish those who in recent days have blasphemed against the Republic. End quote. In a May 17th paper delivered to the Jacobin Club, 
Camille de Moulin goes even further, writing that the Girondins are, quote, almost all upholders of the monarchy, accomplices of the treasons of de Maurier and Bouronville, controlled by the agents of Pitt, d'Orléans, and Prussia, and having sought to divide France into 20 or 30 federative republics, or rather to upset it so that there would no longer be a republic at all. End quote. These claims of trying to divide France into a bunch of federative republics are baseless. There are many local movements to set up local republics, but there's no evidence that the British and Prussians are trying to do anything of the sort, and there's much less evidence that the Girondins are colluding with them. But to de Moulin, in a case of conspiracy, it is absurd to ask for positive evidence. The next day, May 18th, the Girondins win a vote to establish a new 12-man committee called the Commission of Twelve to investigate the Paris Commune and other Paris radicals, and if necessary, to bring charges against anyone who aims to overthrow the National Convention. One delegate, Marguerite Elie Godet, goes even further and proposes that the National Convention dissolve the Commune by force and establish a convention made up of alternate members to meet in the city of Bourges and run the country should anything happen to the duly elected convention. He is voted down. I said a minute ago that the Girondids would bring three prominent members of the mountain up on charges. So far, they've tried and failed to convict Georges Danton and Jean-Paul Marat. The third person they try to convict is Jacques Hibert. We haven't met Hibert yet, but he's an important character in the revolution and he's worth talking about. Jacques Hibert is a 35-year-old failed lawyer who had moved to Paris in his early 20s to become a playwright. After failing at that, he worked at a few odd jobs and allegedly became a con artist before finding his calling as a writer of political pamphlets. Through his writing, he's become a prominent member of the Jacobin Club before quitting to join the Cordelier Club. His newspaper, Le Père du Chien, becomes popular with the masses mostly because it uses common, everyday language. Instead of eloquent prose and broad discussions of political theory, its articles are often fictitious anecdotes of conversations he's had with various caricatures of French society, with liberal use of profanity. I'm going to include a quote here for context, and fair warning, it includes stronger language than I typically use on this show, so if you'll excuse the pun, pardon my French. In this article, Hibert is on a public coach having a presumably fictional conversation with a former royal bureaucrat who has lost his job. The unemployed bureaucrat asks Hibert who wins in the French Revolution, and he answers, quote, Who wins? I win, you fucking liar. All the people in the cities, all the peasants in the countryside, all the honest people of all classes. Salt at two sous, the former nobles and priests subject to the same taxes as us, and this to our relief. No more of those worthless intendants and subdelegates. No more preferential treatment for anyone. No more of this game that ate us. No more Bastilles, no more of those prisons where we were buried on the word of a fucking squealer. No other means of getting ahead except merit. Above all, no more of those fucking brigands with red books who cost us so much and prove that the taxes we paid went into the pockets of the fucking do-nothings of the court. If I wanted to spell out all that the people have won, I'd never finish. You know this as well as I. Damn, but you're a bald-faced liar. And you think we're stupid enough to believe you. End quote. In the past... Jacques Hibert has accused Marie Antoinette, without evidence, of having numerous affairs, and has mocked Louis XVI as a cuckold. 
He's an ardent critic of the Catholic Church and writes that Jesus Christ was not the Son of God, but a sans culot. He's married to a former nun with whom he has a daughter, and he supports both of them in a lavish house that includes a substantial art collection. Apparently, his hatred of the rich does not extend to publishers of radical political newspapers. On May 23rd, five days after the establishment of the Commission of Twelve, Hibert accuses the Girondins of conspiring with royalists to overthrow the National Convention and massacre the members of the Mountain. The Girondins smell blood, and the Commission orders his arrest the following day, May 24th. On May 25th, a delegation from the Paris Commune comes to the Convention to demand his release. In response, the current president of the National Convention, a Girondin delegate named Maximin Isnard, famously says, quote, I tell you, in the name of the whole of France, that if these endless insurrections should cause harm to the Parliament of the nation, Paris will be annihilated, and men will search the banks of the Seine for signs of the city. End quote. The next day, May 26th, the sans will try to prove him wrong. Claire Lacombe leads the Club of Revolutionary Republican Women Citizens in a protest demanding he bears release, and they're joined by a large band of sans Robespierre gives a speech calling for the expulsion of the Girondins from the National Convention. On May 27th, the delegates of the Mountain will succeed in a vote to disband the Commission of Twelve and release Jacques Hibert. The vote is taken under duress, with a large sans culot mob occupying both the gallery and the area outside the building. The next day, May 28th, the Girondins will win their last vote ever to restore the Commission, but by that point Hibert has already been released. At this point, the Commission of Twelve begins meeting in a separate building, surrounded by armed guards. On May 30th, members of the Mountain call again for the disbanding of the Commission, once again supported by an angry mob of sans culot But no vote is taken. On May 31st, there will be no need for a vote. Yet again, Mob violence is about to determine the course of the revolution. At six in the morning on May 31, 1793, representatives from 33 of Paris's 48 sections storm the Hotel de Ville and expel the Commune. They install a new city government, which notably includes the existing mayor and several of the old Commune members, but they swear a new oath that requires them to rule in the name of the sovereign people. This new insurrectionary commune orders the city's alarm bells rung and fires a warning cannon to call the people to arms. In and of itself, this is a revolution against the revolution, since by law only the National Convention can sound the city alarm. A band of armed Parisians, followers of the new insurrectionary commune, then storms the National Convention and presents a list of demands. These are, quote, 1. A charge sheet against 22 named Girondin deputies. 2. A charge sheet against the Committee of Twelve. 3. A demand for the creation of a revolutionary army of sans culot in every town of France, including 20,000 men in Paris. 4. The establishment of workshops for the manufacture of arms for the sans culot. 5. Bread to cost no more than three sous per pound. 6. The arrest of Le Brun Tendu and Clavier. 7. The closing of the postal administration and the purging of all other administrations. 8. The disarmament, arrest, and condemnation of all suspects. 9. Voting rights to be restricted to sans culot. 
10. Expansion of the Revolutionary Tribunal. 11. The establishment of workshops for the old and infirm. 12. The exaction of a forced loan of 1 billion livres from the rich. 13. The immediate payment of indemnities to defenders of the country. 14. A purge of the Committee of Public Safety and of the Executive Council. End quote. That's quite the list, and it sends the National Convention into a flurry of activity. Most of the demands are non-starters, such as the restriction of voting rights to sans culot. That would disenfranchise every member of the convention. The disarmament, arrest, and condemnation of all suspects is also controversial, to say the least, since the suspects in question are 22 leading members of the Girondin party. Still, the convention needs to make some kind of concessions, and Robespierre, as usual, makes no bones about where he stands. He gives a long-winded speech praising the sans and when a Girondin delegate tells him to conclude his speech already, he says, quote, Yes, I shall conclude, and against you. Against you who, after the revolution of August 10th, sought to send those who made it to the scaffold. Against you who have constantly called for the destruction of Paris. Against you who tried to save the tyrant. Against you who conspired with Du Maurier. Against you, who bitterly pursued the very patriots whose heads de Maurier demanded. Against you, whose criminal vengeance has provoked the very cries of indignation that you want to make a crime on the part of your victims. Well, my conclusion is a decree of accusation against all the accomplices of de Maurier and all those designated by the petitioners. End quote. Robespierre doesn't win the day quite yet. After several hours of debate, the National Convention only agrees to disband the Committee of Twelve. Things quiet down on June 1st. The Convention orders the arrest of Jean-Marie Roland, the Girondin politician who had discovered Louis XVI's hidden documents and then resigned two days after the King's execution. Roland flees to the south of France and goes into hiding, although Madame Roland remains behind in Paris to advocate for him. She is then placed under arrest herself, and Jacques Hibert's newspaper, Le Père du Chien, runs a cartoon depicting the beautiful socialite as a toothless old hag. Madame Roland is the first prominent Girondin to be imprisoned in June 1793, but she will not be the last. Meanwhile, the new commune is meeting throughout the day, trying to figure out how to proceed. They don't even represent all of Paris's 48 sections, so they're not sure how far they can push things. But they finally decide to go for broke, and they call on François Henriot, an enragé leader I hadn't bothered to mention, to lead an army of sans culot against the National Convention. After the convention convenes on the morning of June 2nd, 1793, the building is quickly surrounded by an 80,000-strong mix of National Guards, sans culot, and even some cannons. Bertrand Barrère, one of the uncommitted plain delegates, suggests a compromise. He proposes that the 22 Girondin delegates in question be suspended, but not arrested. This pleases nobody. The Girondins protest that this amounts to a coup against the elected members of the convention by an armed mob. François Henriot says that if the 22 delegates are not arrested within the hour, he will order his cannons to fire on the convention and blow them all up. Harold de Seychelles, the sitting president of the convention, leads a group of delegates outside to try to mingle with the assembled mob and defuse tensions. But every exit from the grounds is barred by Henriot's National Guardsmen. 
Inside the building, angry sans-culottes are calling for blood from the public gallery. Defeated, the National Convention votes to place the 22 Girondin delegates under house arrest. Some will escape Paris in the coming days. Others remain and will ultimately pay with their lives. At the end of June 2nd, the Mountain holds a clear majority in the National Convention, one which it will not relinquish for almost 14 months. But everyone knows who really runs the show, and it's not the Mountain as a whole. Neither Robespierre nor Danton nor any of the other leaders has made this decision either. The uprising of June 2nd, 1793 is just as much a coup as the uprising of August 10th, 1792, and it's been executed by the angriest members of the Paris population. For the next 14 months, the revolutionary government will be ruled by whoever can harness the power of the mob. As Simon Schammer writes, quote, Revolutionary government would be guillotined in the name of revolutionary democracy. The aftermath of June 2nd is controversial, and it's one of those events where people often try to interpose modern politics onto a time and place where it's not really warranted. Many conservative historians portray it as the end of true French democracy and a victory for the left. This may have some truth to it, but let's remember that the Girondins aren't a conservative party. They're just not quite as far left as the mountain. At the same time, some Marxist historians portray the June 2nd coup as a victory for the people over a non-responsive government. This is true insofar as the coup is executed by Sankulo leaders, but the remaining delegates to the National Convention are still running a bourgeoisie government. Moreover, if we're going to talk about government by the people, we need to remember that the people includes all of France, not just the Paris Sans-Culot, and that outside of Paris, the Girondins are by far the more popular party. In the rest of France, the coup of June 2nd leads to a widespread popular uprising. Although not nearly as coordinated or impactful as the war in the Vendée, it's still worth mentioning. In his book, The French Revolution, From Enlightenment to Tyranny, British historian Ian Davidson writes, quote, The so-called Civil War had surged to a peak in the middle of June 1793, when some 60 French departments out of 83 were nominally in rebellion against the regime in Paris. But this was not in any meaningful sense a concerted rebellion, as it was, in general, shallow, fragile, and localized. Even where the ostensible supporters of the Girondins were strong, they never held a coherent strategy of fight back and were relatively easy to defeat. So, unlike the Vendée, the Civil War was short-lived. But the worst of it was that when the Paris revolutionaries defeated the rebels, as they eventually did, they were seldom magnanimous or generous. Instead, they often inflicted a level of punishment that was in many cases extreme, sometimes barbaric and by definition counterproductive. In Normandy, the rebellion was quickly defeated and Jean-Baptiste Robert Lindet, sent to pacify the region, kept repression to a minimum. In Bordeaux, the saint colos sections overthrew the rebellious pro-Girondin authorities, and the rebellion was soon over. End quote. The most successful uprising is in the southeast, along the Mediterranean coast. There, revolutionary troops are barely able to hold on to Marseille in late August, and on August 27th, the city of Toulon defects to the British, who quickly occupy the area. It's not retaken until December 19th, 1793, 
and only then, thanks to an artillery bombardment devised by a 24-year-old Corsican artillery commander named Napoleon Bonaparte, who's starting to make a name for himself as a master tactician. In reconquered cities, the reprisals by revolutionary tribunals are brutal. Speaking just of the city of Lyon, Ian Davidson writes, quote, The punishment of the population was massive, wholesale, and horrific. A first tribunal carried out 106 executions by firing squad. A second, 79 by guillotine. But a third tribunal moved on to mass executions by what were called mitraillade, the point-blank firing of cannon filled with shot into crowds of people, in the so-called Plain de Proteau, where 268 people died. In all, the number of those executed at Lyon, according to the most detailed history of the affair, was probably nearly 1900. End quote. These executions by cannon are particularly gruesome since most of the people who are shot aren't killed by the initial blast, only maimed. So soldiers armed with swords have to go through the groups of wounded, groaning people and stab them to death. As an interesting coda to this, two of the last people put to death in Lyon are the executioner, a guy named Jean Ripet, and his assistant. Apparently they too are suspected of being counter-revolutionaries, and another executioner is brought in from out of town to guillotine them. While the rest of France is in flames, the National Convention, such as it is, is hurrying to create a new constitution. The latest coup has made everyone nervous, and the sooner a new government can be codified, the thinking goes, the sooner things will settle down. Let's also remember that there's a war on, and in the summer of 1793, things aren't looking so great for the Revolutionary Army. Anyway, the new constitution is drafted in the first week of June and passed on June 24th. The primary authors of the constitution of 1793 are both close adherents of Max Mien Robespierre. The first is the young lawyer who will go on to be called the Archangel of Terror, Louis Saint-Just, who had given a fiery speech in favor of Louis XVI's execution. The other is wheelchair-bound Georges Couthon, an eloquent lawyer in his own right, who accepts the surrender of counter-revolutionaries in Lyon prior to the reprisals we just talked about. Robespierre himself has already spoken extensively about the need for expanded rights under the new constitution, and while he doesn't participate in its drafting, his fingerprints are all over it via the words of Couthon and Saint-Just. The first article of the 1793 Constitution states that the purpose of society is general happiness, and it goes on to guarantee a number of rights, including the rights to work, education, and financial assistance for the poor. It guarantees the right to vote for all male citizens, as well as to foreigners who have lived in France for at least one year, married a French woman, or even provided money to elderly French people. It abolishes the electoral system, instead establishing a policy of one person, one vote, with individual legislators elected directly by their local constituency. It includes the right to freedom of the press and even recognizes the right of the people to popular insurrection. These last two rights will soon be swept away with Robespierre's blessing in the name of national security. But on paper, the Constitution of 1793 is the gold standard of Enlightenment democracy. The National Convention approves the new Constitution on June 24, 1793, at which point it provisionally goes into effect. 
It's then submitted to a vote of the people for final ratification, but due to the war and all the counter-revolutionary uprisings, the final tally isn't counted until early 1794. Approximately one-fourth of eligible citizens actually vote, and the total count is 1,801,918 in favor and 11,610 against. So voter participation rates are dismal, and the count is the kind of lopsided result you only see in totalitarian countries with widespread fraud and voter intimidation. Which isn't surprising because, as we'll see, revolutionary France is about to ignore its constitution and turn into a totalitarian state with powers that Louis XVI could only have dreamed of. On the other side of the coin, the enragé leaders are still not satisfied. On June 25th, the day after the Constitution is ratified, the radical juring priest Jacques Roux comes to the convention and gives an impassioned speech that has come to be known as the Manifesto of the Enragé. In it, he condemns the new Constitution for not going far enough. At one point, he argues, quote, For the last four years, the rich alone have profited from the advantages of the revolution. The merchant aristocracy, more terrible than that of the noble and sacerdotal aristocracy, has made a cruel game of invading individual fortunes in the treasury of the public. We still don't know what will be the term of their exactions, for the price of merchandise rises in a frightful manner from morning to evening. Citizen representatives, it is time that the combat unto death that the egoist carries out against the hardest working class of society come to an end. Pronounce against speculators and monopolists. Either they'll obey your decrees or they won't. In the first hypothesis, you will have saved the fatherland. In the second case, you will still have saved the fatherland for we will have been able to identify and strike the bloodsuckers of the people. And can the property of knaves be more sacred than the life of a man? Armed forces at the disposal of administrative bodies. How can they not be able to requisition those goods necessary to life? The legislator has the right to declare war, i.e., to have men massacred. How could he then not have the right to prevent the grinding down and starvation of those who guard their homes? The freedom of commerce is the right to use and to make use of, and not the right to tyrannize and prevent use. Those goods necessary to all should be delivered at a price accessible to all. Pronounce then, the sans-culot with their pikes will execute your decrees. End quote. Rue is not entirely wrong. The French Revolution is and will remain a revolution of the bourgeoisie, or upper middle class, not a revolution of the proletariat, or working class. It never was and never will be interested in improving the lot of the average farmer or worker, only with winning their votes. To give one example of how this plays out, most of the men who lead the reprisals against the counter-revolutionaries in Lyon become rich overnight by confiscating the goods and businesses of the people they've killed. Needless to say, the convention doesn't want to hear about this. With his speech, Rue puts a target on his own back, and he will be arrested in September on trumped-up charges of stealing charitable funds. He will remain in prison until February of 1794, when he kills himself rather than face trial before a kangaroo court. The enragé movement will die along with him. The freedoms guaranteed by the 1793 Constitution will die even sooner. On July 9, 1793, a 24-year-old woman named Charlotte Corday boards a stagecoach in the city of Caen. Located in Normandy just a few miles from the English Channel, Caen is a hotbed of the new Girondin counter-revolutionary movement, 
and Charlotte Corday is one of the movement's staunchest advocates. She's the daughter of minor aristocrats, and when her mother had died during her childhood, her father had sent her to an abbey to be raised by nuns. During her time in the abbey, she had fallen in love with the writings of French Enlightenment philosophers like Rousseau and Voltaire, as well as becoming steeped in ancient Greek and Roman philosophy. Corday is a Republican, and was a supporter of the early revolution and even the execution of Louis XVI. But Charlotte Corday, like most Girondins, is disturbed that the direction the French Revolution has taken. Rather than reflecting the will of the French people, it's become a Parisian Revolution in all but name, representing only the views of a handful of Paris radicals. One event in particular has turned Corday against the delegates of the mountain. When her mother had died, a priest named Abbé Gombault had given her the last rites and had acted as a surrogate father figure to Charlotte during her time in the Abbey. But Gombault had refused to take the civic oath and gone into hiding in the woods outside Cannes where radical revolutionaries had tracked him down with dogs. They had him brought back to Cannes by force and guillotined him on April 5th, 1793. Charlotte Corday had started reading counter-revolutionary newspapers and eventually came to the conclusion that Jean-Paul Marat was to blame for the revolution's newer, darker direction. One such newspaper read, quote, Let Marat's head fall and the Republic is saved. Purge France of this man of blood. Marat sees the public safety only in a river of blood. Well, then his own must flow, for his head must fall to save 200,000 others. End quote. Charlotte Corday boards the stagecoach for Paris, determined to do just that. She intends to assassinate Marat in the chambers of the National Convention itself, in what she sees as a public execution. But when she arrives in Paris late on July 12th, she learns that Marat is not meeting in person with the convention. His skin condition is acting up and he's working from home in his bathtub, which means that Corday will need to find some way to get inside his house. On the morning of July 13th, she stands in the street in front of Marat's house and shouts that she has detailed information about the leaders of the Girondin uprising in Cannes. At first, she's ignored, but she shouts again and again, and eventually Marat hears her and asks his girlfriend to let her in. Corday is led up to the room where Marat sits in his bath and she gives him a sheet of paper with made-up names. As he studies the paper, he says, very well, these people will all be guillotined, and he begins to copy down the names. And while he's distracted, she plunges a six-inch knife into his heart, and he bleeds out in the bathtub. In her book, Fatal Purity, Robespierre and the French Revolution, British historian Ruth Skurr notes of Marat, quote, It was not so hard to kill him. Small, frail, sick, naked, defenseless figure that he was. End quote. Jean-Paul Marat's cry of pain draws a crowd, and Charlotte Corday is taken into custody. Over the next four days, she is subjected to three separate cross-examinations at the National Convention, where she is repeatedly accused of having co-conspirators and repeatedly insists that she acted alone. She is condemned to death and is executed by guillotine on July 17, 1793. I talked about her execution in the last episode, so I won't rehash it here except to correct an error. In the addendum at the end of the episode, I 
said that an executioner's assistant named Francois Legros took her head from the basket and slapped her face. This is partially wrong. Francois Legros was not, in fact, an assistant executioner, but a carpenter who had helped build the guillotine. And Paris executioner Charles-Henri Sanson would correct the record several times during his own lifetime, indignant at the accusation that one of his assistants would abuse a corpse in this way. That said, the revolutionary regime does a little corpse abusing of its own. This is a more sexist age, and many in the National Convention still can't believe that Charlotte Corday acted alone. They believed that she must have been assisted by a male accomplice who she was sleeping with, so they have her body examined to see if she's still a virgin. To their disappointment, the medical examiner finds that she is. Charlotte Corday leaves behind her a manifesto called Address to the French, the Friends of Law and Peace in which she explains her motivations for Marat's assassination. In it, she writes, quote, How long, O miserable Frenchman, will you be pleased with disorder and divisions? Long enough and too long have some factious men, some wicked men, placed the interest of their ambition in the place of the general interest. Why, victims of their fury, do you destroy yourselves to establish their desire of tyranny over the ruins of France? Already the indignant departments march on Paris. Already the fire of discord and civil war inflame the half of this vast empire. There is still a means of extinguishing it, but the means must be prompt. Already the vilest of the wicked, Marat, whose name alone presents the image of all crime, in falling under the avenging steel, shakes the mountain and makes Danton grow pale. Robespierre, those other brigands seated upon the bloody throne, are enveloped in the lightning which the avenging gods of humanity only suspend, without doubt, to render their fall more glittering and to affright all those who would be tempted to establish their fortunes on the ruins of an abused people. Frenchmen, you know your enemies. Arise, march. Let the mountain annihilated leave only brothers and friends. I do not know if heaven reserved to us a republican government, but it cannot give us a leader of the mountain for master unless in the excess of vengeance. France, thy repose defends on the execution of the laws. I do not give a blow to them in killing Marat. Condemned by the universe, he is without the law. What tribunal will judge me? I desire that my last sigh may be useful to my fellow citizens, that my head, born in Paris, may be a sign of rallying for all friends of the laws, that the tottering mountain may see its ruin written with my blood, that I may be their last victim and the universe avenged may declare that I have deserved well of humanity. If I do not succeed in my enterprise, Frenchman, I have shown you the road. You know your enemies. Arise. March. Strike. End quote. Whatever Charlotte Corday's intentions, Marat's assassination does not open the floodgates of counter-revolution. Almost as soon as he's dead, he becomes a martyr. His body is embalmed and put on display in an elaborate recreation of his moment of death. Streets and buildings are named after him, and 30 towns throughout France are renamed to some variant of his name. At his funeral, eulogies compare his death to the death of Christ, with the idea that his blood will wash France clean of the stain of counter-revolution. Meanwhile, the assassination of Marat serves as the perfect pretext for expanding the revolutionary government's powers. Three days beforehand, on July 10th, 
The National Convention had already voted to restore the Committee of Public Safety as a temporary emergency government under the eye of the convention. The new constitution remains in limbo because it requires a new election for the new National Assembly. And elections are impractical at a time when France faces both civil war and a coalition of foreign enemies. The Committee of Public Safety is smaller and more nimble than the National Convention as a whole, which makes it the perfect government for running a war. What changes on July 13th is the public perception. At first, it had been difficult for the National Convention to square the idea of government by executive committee with the ideals of democracy. With a major political assassination in the heart of Paris, the ever-present mobs accept the new committee without protest. The committees make up changes a few times over the next month, and individual members will continue to cycle in and out periodically, but eventually the total number of members settles at 12. In his book, A People's History of the French Revolution, French Marxist historian Eric Hazan describes the committee in detail. There are several names here, most of which you don't need to remember, but just to give you an idea of how things run, Hazan writes, quote, Barrère was in charge of relations with the convention. Robespierre, Saint-Just, and Couthon dealt with political matters. Bilot Varenne and Collot d'Herbois were f- responsible for correspondence with the civil administrations and the convention's representatives who were away on mission. Linde headed the supply section. Carnot, that of war. Prieur de la Côte d'Or was assigned to armaments and Jean Bon Saint André to the Navy. Structured in this way, the Committee of Public Safety trumped the Executive Council, the ministers, and administered the country over their heads. End quote. Robespierre had joined the Committee of Public Safety two weeks after Marat's assassination, on July 27th, and he serves as its unofficial head. Along with Louis Saint-Just, the Archangel of Terror, and the wheelchair-bound Georges Couthon, he forms a very unofficial ruling triumvirate that will effectively run France for the next year or so. The other members are more or less irrelevant except for one, Lazare Carnot, who joins on August 14, 1793, and will administer military affairs. Carnot is the son of minor government bureaucrats, and like most leading members of the revolution, has been educated in classical philosophy. In 1773, at the age of 18, He was already a respected mathematical prodigy and won a commission as a first lieutenant in the French Army's Engineering Corps. Over the next 13 years, he had not only advanced to the rank of captain, but published a handful of well-received texts on math, physics, and engineering. He had also met Robespierre, who at the time was a young lawyer in Arras. After spending a stint in prison for backing out of a marriage engagement, Carnot married in 1789 and would soon father two sons, one of whom, Nicolas Léonard Sédi Carnot, would become a noted scientist in his own right and is now known as the father of thermodynamics. In 1791, Lazare Carnot would win a seat in the Legislative Assembly, but his military career would go on the back burner. Instead, he would serve on the Committee of Public Instruction, where he would propose a number of reforms to France's education system, although these reforms will never be implemented because the government keeps changing hands. Carnot only returns to the military when war with Spain is approaching when he goes to the border to oversee the construction of some fortifications. Lazare Carnot differs from most other members of the Committee of Public Safety in one important respect. 
he's not a radical. In fact, he will be siding with the royalists in a few years when the French Revolution takes a more conservative turn. That said, he's the kind of old-fashioned military man who puts his country first regardless of politics. He may not like everything the revolutionary government is doing, but he'll be damned if he sees France beaten by the Austrians, the Prussians, or worst of all, the hated British. And it's safe to say that if not for Carnot, the First Coalition may have won a speedy victory over the divided French Republic. His first major act on August 17, 1793, is a new policy of universal conscription. I've used the term levé en masse already to describe the creation of a large French army, but Lazare Carnot inaugurates the levé en masse, declaring that all Frenchmen are soldiers and that any man who is called upon to serve in the army must do his duty. The idea is to overwhelm France's enemies with a huge popular army whose numbers cannot be matched by the First Coalition. Thanks to Carnot's organizational skills, the army will grow from around 650,000 men to more than 1.5 million men a year later possibly the largest army of all time at this point in history, and certainly the largest at this point outside of China. The ideas of mass conscription and universal male suffrage are inextricably linked. Under the old feudal system, nobles had held the exclusive right to rule, but had also been obligated to serve in the army. Other soldiers were only responsible for fighting because they were paid, either as professionals or as mercenaries. Under the new system, all men have the right to rule, but this comes with the obligation to serve in the military as needed. So while a military draft may seem backwards to modern people, for the people of 18th century France, it is part and parcel of their newfound liberty. To borrow a phrase from Robert Heinlein, service guarantees citizenship. By early September, the first maximum, that price cap on flour and grain, is starting to backfire just as the Girondins had predicted. See, the maximum is directly tied to local prices, so rather than deter hoarding and speculation, it actually encourages both of these practices. When prices are low in one department, people will buy in huge quantities. When prices rise in the same department, people will sell. The result is wild fluctuation in prices, first in one department, then in another, with flour and grain getting traded back and forth around the country, causing constant random shortages in random places. Worse yet, while the grain harvest has been plentiful, there has been little rain in the late summer which means that many of the water mills the French rely on to turn grain into flour, they're not functioning. This only worsens existing shortages and drives up prices even more. Paris is not immune, and as we've seen so many times before, when Parisians get hungry, they get to rioting. On September 4, 1773, a crowd of sans culot gathers in front of the Hotel de Ville, demanding bread from the Paris Commune. And for once, you've actually got to feel sorry for the guys in the Commune, because as powerful as they are, they are, at the end of the day, just a glorified city council. They're not in charge of national economic policy, and they have no way to meet the crowd's demands. Now, as is often the case, this mob is not some spontaneous gathering. 
Some earlier historians pointed to Jacques Roux as the mastermind. Uh, Roux, if you'll remember, is the rabble-rouser priest who wrote the Manifesto of the Enragés. And at this time, he hasn't been imprisoned quite yet, and he is present with the crowd. But the modern consensus points to a different culprit as the mastermind. Jacques Hibert, the far-left author of Le Père du Chien, who also happens to sit on the Paris Commune. Although Hibert is not a member of the National Convention, he has developed a large following of leftist delegates who will come to be known as Hibertists. Preventing from exercising real power in the halls of government, at least on his own, Hibert has turned to the mob to advance his own agenda. Hibert acts as a go-between between between the mob and the commune, and eventually convinces the assembled crowd to disband and reconvene the following day, September 5th, at the National Convention. When they do, they come armed, and they burst into the convention's chambers with a list of demands— the expansion of the Revolutionary Tribunal into four separate tribunals tasked with arresting suspects, the extraction of 100 million livres from the rich in the form of a forced loan, and the creation of a new sans army armed at government expense. For a moment, it looks like Jacques Hibert has just staged another coup, but Robespierre outmaneuvers him. See, Robespierre has been busy getting the Jacobin clubs of all 48 Paris sections to agree on an agenda, and he leads his own unarmed delegation into the convention hall. They also demand a new revolutionary army, but they state that this army should be specifically tasked with confiscating food from hoarders and speculators. So right away they've managed to outflank Hibert on the left by providing a real solution to the Parisians' problems, or at least seeming to tackle them head-on. Robespierre's Jacobins further demand the dismissal of all nobles remaining in the government, and most of all, they demand that terror be put on the agenda. The word terror is vague. As Ian Davidson writes, quote, No one could possibly have known exactly what this would mean. Versions of this tempestuous day differ somewhat, and there are different accounts of when the term terror was first used in a revolutionary sense and by whom. Mathiez tells us that it was Jean-Baptiste Royer, a deputy of the convention and a constitutional bishop, that is, one who had taken the oath of the Constitution Civil du Clergé, who had first used the precise words, Complace le terreur à l'ordre du jour, and that was five days beforehand. According to Michelet, Bertrand Barrère said that it was the Army Revolutionnaire, which, in the words of the Commune, would put terror on the agenda. This kind of confusion about details is characteristic of accounts of the revolution at its most turbulent moments. Yet it is now a widely accepted tradition that it was on this turbulent day, September 5, 1793, when the terror began and was well and truly put on the agenda. There is also some uncertainty about exactly what Robespierre and his Jacobin delegation said, but the deep message was unmistakable. They had decided to upstage the sans demonstrators by subsuming their demands in a new and far-reaching political agenda. Robespierre was massively raising the political stakes in his determination to stay in charge at whatever cost. On September 6, 1793, One day after the Declaration of the Terror, he and the Committee for Public Safety accepted two new members, Jean-Marie Collot de Herbois, a frustrated actor, and Bilot Varenne, both Hibertists. 
If Hibert had had any subversive plans, this would have dealt them a blow, as two of his leading supporters had now been effectively co-opted by the government. End quote. In fact, as early as July 26, 1793, Robespierre had privately advocated making a terrible example of counter-revolutionaries. The day before he takes his seat on the Committee of Public Safety, he writes what Ruth Skurr calls a personal revolutionary catechism that reads as follows. Quote, what is our aim? It is the use of the Constitution for the benefit of the people. Who is likely to oppose it? The rich and the corrupt. What methods will they employ? Slander and hypocrisy. What factors will encourage the use of such means? The ignorance of the sans culot. The people must therefore be instructed. What are the obstacles to their enlightenment? The paid journalists who mislead the people every day by shameless distortions. What conclusion follows? That we ought to proscribe these writers as the most dangerous enemies of the country and to circulate an abundance of good literature. The people. What other obstacle is there to their instruction? Their destitution. When... Will the people be educated? When they have enough to eat? When the rich and the government stop bribing treacherous pens and tongues to deceive them and instead identify their own interests with those of the people? When will this be? Never. What other obstacles are there to the achievement of freedom? The war at home and abroad. By what means can the foreign war be ended? by placing Republican generals at the head of our armies and by punishing those who have betrayed us. How can we end the Civil War? By punishing traitors and conspirators, especially those deputies and administrators who are to blame. By sending patriot troops under patriot leaders to cut down the aristocrats of Lyon, Marseille, Toulon, and the Vendée, the Jura, and all other districts where the banner of royalism and rebellion has been raised, and by making a terrible example of all the criminals who have outraged liberty and spilled the blood of patriots. End quote. Meanwhile, the giant of the revolution, Georges Danton, has set himself up as the leader of a new moderate faction which will come to be known as the Dantonists, he also favors the creation of a new revolutionary army, saying, I know that when the people present their needs, when they offer to march against their enemies, no other measures need be taken than those which they propose themselves, as it is the national spirit that has dictated them. When offered a seat on the Committee of Public Safety, he refuses on the grounds that after his previous stint as head of the committee, he had sworn an oath not to take a seat on the committee again. Instead, he aims to take on the Hebertists directly in the National Convention. While the Hebertists constantly call for war without end, Danton advocates a policy of peace through strength simultaneously building the French army into an unmatched fighting force and sending unofficial peace delegations to Spain, Austria, and other members of the First Coalition. But crucially, Danton also favors the use of terror to root out counter-revolutionaries and co-sponsors the motion to expand the Revolutionary Tribunal. So, while the Hebertists and Dantonists battle for supremacy in the convention and Robespierre tries to rule via the Committee of Public Safety, they're all in agreement on this new policy of terror. The Reign of Terror, which begins on September 5, 1793 and will last until July 27, 1794, isn't just about eliminating the revolution's political enemies. Some might argue that it's a military necessity. 
The levé en masse will take time to show fruit. Men have to be recruited and trained before they can be put in the field, and in the meantime the entire regime is at risk of falling. The various little Federalist revolts that broke out with the expulsion of the Girondins from the National Convention are at their apex. The Catholic and Royal Army is beating government troops left and right in the Vendée. The Prussians have pushed back into the border region of Alsace-Lorraine, and Austrian troops have once again crossed from Belgium into northern France and are 100 miles from Paris. The British have sunk a French fleet, are pillaging French colonies throughout the world, and have blockaded France into near-total isolation. Even Spain has taken a couple of fortresses on the southern frontier. Even a fully united France would be hard-pressed to beat back this many enemies, and the revolutionary government is willing to do whatever it takes, no matter how terrible, to unite the country. The total death toll in the revolutionary reign of terror is a bit murky. The official tally shows just under 17,000 people guillotined. But those are just the people who are tried, convicted, and executed under revolutionary law. At least 300,000 people are imprisoned, far too many for the revolutionary government to adequately care for, and around 10,000 of those people at least die in prison. Not only that, but between 10,000 and 12,000 people are subjected to street justice, otherwise known as lynching. This leaves us with a ballpark figure of 35,000 to as many as 40,000 people or more, depending on how exactly you count. I should also note that this total doesn't include the people killed in reprisals for the war in the Vendée, which we'll get into in a little bit. To understand how so many people can be arrested, much less executed, we need to look at another act of the National Convention, the so-called Law of Suspects, which is passed on September 17, 1793. This law officially outlines who can be arrested by the Revolutionary Tribunal. Quote, Immediately after the publication of the present decree, all suspects within the territory of the Republic and still at large shall be placed in custody. The following are deemed suspects. 1. Those who, by their conduct, associations, comments, or writings, have shown themselves partisans of tyranny or federalism and enemies of liberty. 2. Those who are unable to justify, in the manner prescribed by the decree of March 21st, their means of existence and the performance of their civic duties. 3. Those to whom certificates of patriotism have been refused. 4. Civil servants suspended or dismissed from their positions by the National Convention or by its commissioners and not reinstated, especially those who have been or are to be dismissed by virtue of the decree of August 14th. 5. Those former nobles, along with husbands, wives, fathers, mothers, sons or daughters, brothers or sisters, and agents of the emigres, who have not constantly demonstrated their devotion to the revolution. 6. Those who have emigrated between July 1, 1789 and the publication of the decree of March 30th, even though they may have returned to France within the period established by said decree. End quote. As you can see, the list of people who can be arrested is pretty long. Basically, anyone who isn't an active, outspoken friend of the revolution is suspect, thanks to that little clause about arresting people who haven't received a certificate of patriotism. The bit about conduct, associations, comments, or writings is also pretty broad. If one of your friends has turned counter-revolutionary, you're a suspect. 
If your neighbor decides that they want your house and tells the local surveillance committee that they heard you call the national convention a bunch of idiots, you're a suspect. The law of suspects is further extended on September 29th to cover anyone who evades a new set of price controls called the general maximum. The general maximum extends the existing price controls to all kinds of products, including not just food, but also oil, firewood, paper, and leather, among other things. Anyone who sells or buys products at a price above the maximum can be fined. And since the law of suspects is extended to cover violators, those same people can then be locked up and potentially even executed. In theory, the general maximum is intended to target hoarders and speculators. But in practice, most of the victims are farmers and shopkeepers who are basically forced to sell products at a loss or face prosecution. The result is easy to guess. Grocery stores and general stores close or go out of business throughout France. Farmers either limit production to their own subsistence or sell excess goods on the black market. Law-abiding citizens turn to that black market to purchase household necessities or even become smugglers themselves in order to make a living. Existing food shortages get worse. The revolutionary currency, the assignat, inflates to ever more worthless levels. People starve, especially the poorest citizens who had already been living at a subsistence level. And everywhere, the local surveillance committees are employing snitches and arresting anyone who even looks like they may be violating the law. So much for the revolution's slogan of liberty, equality, and brotherhood. One of the first victims of the Reign of Terror is a character we haven't checked on in a while. Marie Antoinette, the widow of Louis XVI who has been living under house arrest for several months now. During her imprisonment, the revolutionary government has gone to great lengths to make her and her children uncomfortable. She and her daughter, Marie-Therese Charlotte, are held in one set of chambers, but the eight-year-old Dauphin, heir to the throne, Louis Charles, also known as Louis XVII, is held in a separate chamber upstairs. The women are given no privacy from their male jailers, who often come around to stare at them and even blow cigarette smoke in their faces. Meanwhile, Louis Charles's education is given to a barely literate Paris shoemaker named Henry Simon, who gives the boy liquor to drink, teaches him to gamble, and provides him with a combination of revolutionary and outright pornographic literature to read. This is done intentionally to mock the monarchy, corrupt the boy's morals, and further break Marie Antoinette's heart. On all three counts, it appears to be effective. At one point, one of the jailers is playing a game with Louis Charles, and when they overhear Marie Antoinette and Marie-Therese Charlotte moving some furniture around downstairs, the Dauphin reportedly says, Haven't those fucking whores been guillotined yet? On August 1, 1793, Bertrand Barrère, the spokesman for the Committee of Public Safety, announces to the National Convention that Marie Antoinette is to be brought up on charges, although the charges themselves are not yet named. That night, she is moved from the temple to the Conciergerie, one of Paris's prisons. During the transfer, she bumps her head on a doorframe, and when her jailer asks if she is hurt, answers that nothing can hurt her now. All other members of the Bourbon dynasty are ordered into exile, with four exceptions. Louis Charles and Marie-Therese Charlotte are to be held indefinitely to prevent them being used to continue Louis XVI's bloodline, while Philippe Egalité, the first prince of the blood, and Madame Elizabeth, Louis XVI's sister, are to testify in Marie Antoinette's trial. 
Given the revolution's current bent, there can be little doubt that the Committee of Public Safety plans to execute the Queen after a show trial. To prevent this, some loyal former nobles attempt to engineer an escape. One of them smuggles a message to her, hidden in a carnation that he leaves on her table, trying to work out the details, and the planned jailbreak becomes known as the Carnation Plot. The nobles manage to pay off the warden and most of the guards, but one loyal guard reports the plot to the police, who promptly arrest three of the four conspirators and bring them before the Revolutionary Tribunal. The last conspirator flees into exile and the Carnation plot fails. Planning for the trial takes several weeks, and formal charges aren't entered until October 13th. The trial is overseen by none other than Jacques Hibert, and is scheduled for October 14th, which gives Marie Antoinette's lawyers only one day to enter a defense. In all, there are three charges. Quote, 1. Of having in concert with the king's brothers and the execrable Cologne, dilapidated the French finances in a terrible way, and having sent incalculable sums to the emperor. 2. Of having informed the enemies of France of the plans of campaign and attack drawn up in the council. 3. Of having satellite civil war in various parts of the republic contrary to Section 2 of the Penal Code and Article 2, Caption 1 of the First Section. End quote. She will be found guilty of all three charges, but each one bears mentioning. The first charge, having sent money to the Holy Roman Emperor, is false. Simply put, Marie Antoinette had no authority over royal finances and could not possibly have been guilty of sending the state's money to anyone. The second charge of spying for the Austrians is true. We now have documentary proof of Marie Antoinette sending French military plans to opposing armies. However, there is no hard evidence of this at the time, and she is convicted based on hearsay and based on having sent personal letters to her relatives in Austria, which is not a crime. The third charge of encouraging the current Girondin uprising is ridiculous. For one thing, Marie Antoinette had been in prison for months before the uprising began, and her communications were closely monitored. For another thing, the Queen hates the Girondins almost as much as she hates the more radical delegates, so the idea that she would be helping them of all people is laughable. There is a fourth charge, the most heinous, and it's the only one the Queen is able to beat. I should note at this point that while King Louis was tried before the National Convention, Marie Antoinette's trial is a criminal one, not political. So while Jacques Hibert is present, she's not being judged by the Paris Commune or the National Convention. There's a criminal judge and a jury that, in theory, is supposed to be impartial. And as with all criminal trials, there are people in the public gallery. Anyway, Scottish historian John Hardman writes about the fourth criminal charge in his book, Marie Antoinette, The Making of a French Queen. Quote, There was no conclusive evidence to convict Marie Antoinette, so it was thought necessary to blacken her character by accusing her and Madame Elizabeth of incest with the eight-year-old Dauphin. Jacques Hibert organized this and visited the temple, where the boy signed a statement to the effect that his mother had taught him how to masturbate that he did it so vigorously that one of his testicles had swelled and needed bandaging, and that the three of them had lain together. His sister was interrogated and replied that she didn't fully understand the accusation, but she had seen nothing. Madame Elizabeth likewise refuted the charge. Marie Antoinette's character sketch of the Dauphin when aged four has relevance here. She told Madame de Tourzel, 
He has a tendency to repeat what he has heard, and without exactly lying, he often embroiders it with what his imagination suggests. Hibert's intervention had been orchestrated by Fouquier Tanville, who concluded his preliminary observations. That finally the widow Capet, immoral in every respect, the new Agrippina, is so perverse and so familiar with every crime that forgetting her quality of mother and the limits placed by the laws of nature, she did not blush to give herself over with Louis Charles Capet and by his own admission to indecency whose very name makes one shudder. When Hibert produced his evidence in court, Marie Antoinette disdained to answer the charge. But one juror would not let the matter rest. Citizen President, I respectfully invite you to remind the accused that she has not replied to the matter raised by Citizen Hibert concerning what passed between her and her son. Herman, the judge, perhaps with some distaste, put it to the Queen, who replied, If I did not respond, it was because it would be against nature for a mother to reply to such an accusation. On this I appeal to all the mothers who may be here. End quote. This statement wins applause from the women in the gallery and the charge of incest is quietly dropped. When Robespierre hears about the incest charge later that night over dinner at the Jacobin Club, he gets so angry that he smashes a plate and calls Hibert an imbecile for making the Queen look sympathetic. In the end, it doesn't matter. Marie Antoinette is found guilty of treason and sentenced to death. In her final statement, she says, quote, I was a queen, and you took away my crown. A wife, and you killed my husband. A mother, and you took away my children. My blood alone remains. Take it, but do not make me suffer long. End quote. She does not have to. The execution is scheduled for the next day, October 16th. That morning, the executioner cuts Marie Antoinette's hair and ties her hands together. His name is Henri Sanson, the son of another executioner, Charles Henri Sanson, who had executed King Louis. Charles Henri and Henri represent the fourth and fifth generations respectively of a six-generation dynasty of Paris executioners, and they're both professional and apolitical. They serve whoever rules Paris and execute whomever they are ordered to execute. When her hands are first bound, Marie Antoinette complains that the rope is too tight. She's ignored. However, when the open cart arrives to transport her to the place of execution, she suddenly needs to relieve herself, which is understandable, so Henri Sanson loosens her bonds. When she's ready, she's placed in the cart, facing backwards, and paraded around Paris so everyone can see her before she's taken to the Place de la République, the same place Louis was executed. Alongside her sits a juring priest, who she refuses to speak to because she's a devout Catholic. A popular legend says that along the way, some friends have arranged for a non-juring priest to absolve her of her sins, and that she sees him in a window making the sign of the cross and she smiles. This is possible but unlikely, since Marie Antoinette fears for the safety of any hypothetical priest who might attend her. In a letter written to her sister-in-law the night before her execution, she writes, quote, "...having no hope of spiritual consolation, not even knowing whether there are still priests of that religion, meaning non-juring Catholic priests, in France, and feeling that should there be such, I should expose them to great risks were they to visit me here. I sincerely ask God's forgiveness for all the faults I have committed since I was born. End quote. She expresses a number of other personal thoughts in the letter which is never delivered. 
In one of the revolution's more bizarre turns, Marie Antoinette's final testament will be found under Robespierre's mattress after his death. How and why it gets there is anyone's guess. Regardless, the former queen carries herself with dignity right up to the end. She doesn't cry or beg for mercy, and when a popular comedian rides around her cart on his horse making jokes at her expense, she ignores him. When it comes time to mount the scaffold, she does so silently. Her last words are spoken to Henri Sanson, when she accidentally steps on his foot. Pardon me, sir. I did not do it on purpose. Four minutes later, the blade falls, and her severed head is held up like a hunting trophy in front of the cheering crowd. In the grand scheme of things, Marie Antoinette's head is only one of many to get removed during these turbulent months. Four days before her trial, on October 10, 1793, the youngest member of the Committee of Public Safety, Louis Saint-Just, earns his nickname the Archangel of Terror when he announces to the National Convention that the Constitution has been suspended indefinitely. He says, quote, In the circumstances in which the Republic finds itself, the Constitution cannot be set up. It would be destroyed by means of itself. It would become the guarantee of attacks on liberty, because it would lack the force necessary to suppress them. Between the people and their enemies, there can be nothing in common but the sword. We must govern by iron those who cannot be governed by justice. We must oppress the tyrant. It is impossible for revolutionary laws to be executed unless the government itself is truly revolutionary. End quote. In other words, the Committee of Public Safety is taking control of French government until the Civil War and the War of the First Coalition have gotten under control and we can all have proper elections. Oh, and while we're at it, we're going to chop a bunch of people's heads off. It would be impossible to list all of the guillotine's victims, but I want to mention a few of our characters as they exit the stage. The first is Jacques-Pierre Brissot, the guy who had petitioned for the overthrow of Louis XVI and as leader of the Girondins had forced the declaration of war on Austria. He is accused of conspiring with the traitorous General de Maurier and is beheaded on October 31st. Philippe Egalité, King Louis's cousin, the former Duc d'Orléans and the first Prince of the Blood, is not far behind. Despite voting for Louis's death, Philippe is guilty under the law of suspects simply because his son had defected to the Austrians. He loses his head on November 6th. You may remember the Rolands, the wealthy and influential power couple with the smart wife who wrote all the husband's letters and the husband who found Louis XVI's secret papers. Well, Marie-Jeanne de Roland is executed for treason on November 8th. Jean-Marie Roland is still in hiding in the south of France, but when he learns of his wife's death on November 10th, he has dinner with some friends thanks them for helping him hide, and walks out into the woods. There, he sits against a tree and stabs himself in the heart. He pins a note to his chest that says, quote, Not fear, but indignation made me quit my retreat. On learning that my wife had been murdered, I did not wish to remain longer on an earth polluted with crimes. End quote. Jean-Sylvain Bailey, the man who had presided over the tennis court oath and become mayor of Paris, is guillotined on November 12th. While he's waiting to be executed, the spectator shouts, Do you tremble, Bailey? And he shouts back, Yes, but it is only the cold. Antoine Barnave, 
The leader of the Fuyans, who had tried to make the constitutional monarchy work, is killed on November 29th. His crime? Exchanging a series of letters with Marie Antoinette before her death. Like I said, 17,000 or so people will get France's least desirable haircut during the Reign of Terror, and these are just the victims we've touched on in our story. So as we move forward, just imagine that at the middle of your city is a guillotine with a pile of severed heads, and that every day a few more people get their heads debodified. It's worth noting that not everybody is okay with this. And I'm not just talking about the Girondins who are getting purged. Georges Danton is also exposed to the terror, at least the way it's being carried out. And when it becomes clear that he can't muster enough votes to stop it, he abruptly retires on October 10th, using a minor illness as an excuse. He will eventually be convinced to return to politics in late November, but his influence will be sorely missed. In his biography, David Laude tells a story where Danton is doing some gardening and his neighbor comes by waving a newspaper. Quote, Good news, the neighbor cried. What, Danton said. Look, read this. The Girondins have been condemned and executed. Good news? You call that good news, my poor man, Danton said with a sigh, tears welling in his eyes. Weren't they splitters? Dissenters? Dissenters? Aren't we all dissenters, Danton said. We all deserve to die as much as they do. One after the other, we shall all meet their end. End quote. The French Revolution doesn't just aim to reshape French politics. The new, more radical revolution seeks to rebuild every facet of French life. Much of this rebuilding takes place in the world of the arts, where religious sculptures and paintings are out and patriotic revolutionary artwork is in. Even what we might call the low arts are affected. For example, in French playing cards of the time, the Queen of Hearts becomes Liberty of the Arts, and the King of Hearts is now a sans culot. But nowhere does the cultural aspect of the revolution hit closer to home than with the creation of the Republican calendar. The Republican calendar represents an attempt to create a newer, more rational calendar for a more enlightened age. To begin with, no more of this old ADBC nonsense. The Republican calendar is to begin with the founding of the Republic, which the revolutionaries date as September 22, 1792. But that's just the first of many changes. Instead of 12 months of unequal length, there are to be 12 months of 30 days each, with a five-day holiday period at the end of each year. Instead of the old months derived from the Romans, the months are now to have new names to represent the changing of the seasons. These names are made up on the spot by Fabre de Glantin, an actor and writer who now serves in the National Convention and is a member of George Danton's party. Deglantine's calendar begins in fall to coincide with the autumnal equinox, and while I'll be using regular dates throughout the rest of the story, some of the revolution's key events, like the Thermidorian reaction, are named after months on the revolutionary calendar. The autumn months are named Vandemer, meaning the month of vintage, Brumaire, meaning the month of mist, and Frimaire, meaning the month of frost. The winter months are named Nivos, meaning the snowy month, Pluvios, meaning the rainy month, and Ventos, meaning the windy month. Spring begins with Germinal, derived from the French word for germination, 
and proceeds to Floreal, the flowering month, and then Prairial, meaning prairie or meadow. The summer months are Mesidor, the harvest month, Thermidor, the hot month, and Fructidor, the month of fruit. So far, this might seem like a bunch of silly nonsense. Who cares if it's September 22nd, 1793, or the first of Vendemer, year two? But along with the new 30-day months, the revolutionary government also abolishes the seven-day week in favor of a 10-day decade, with the days called simply day one, day two, and so on. Not only is this not a very imaginative naming system, but the 10-day scheme is intentionally designed to make it harder for people to go to church on Sundays, since Sundays will only line up with your day off once every seven weeks. This is part of a larger de-Christianization program we'll get to in a second. But even if you don't care for religion, this 10-day work week is proof positive that we're dealing with a bourgeoisie revolution, not a proletarian one. Because instead of getting a day off every seven days, workers are now getting a day off every 10 days. So if you're working in some mine or textile mill, the revolution has just added three days to your work week. This goes over as well as you might expect with the working classes. Not only do the days and months get changed, so do the hours and minutes. Each day is arranged into a decimal system with 10 hours, each with 100 decimal minutes, which in turn contain 100 decimal seconds. So, an hour of decimal time works out to something like 144 minutes of normal time, and the minutes and seconds are also different lengths. While the new months and days will stick around until Napoleon takes over, the decimal time system will be abandoned in April 1795 because it's just too confusing. Now, I mentioned that there's a de-Christianization program going on. This program is being led by Jacques Hibert, with support of a handful of Hibertist delegates in the National Convention. One delegate sums things up by saying, quote, It is time, since we have arrived at the summit of the principles of a great revolution, to reveal the truth about all types of religions. All religions are but conventions. Legislators make them to suit the people they govern. It is the moral order of the republic, of the revolution, that we must preach now, that will make us a people of brothers, a people of philosophes. End quote. To be fair, this is an anti-religious movement in general, and no religion is spared. I can only imagine what it's like to be a French Protestant, win your religious freedom just a couple of years ago thanks to the revolution, and then lose it again thanks to that same revolution. But something like 95% of French people are at least nominally Catholic, and Catholicism has been the state religion for all of France's existence, so the target of dechristianization is, first and foremost, the Catholic Church. Like other aspects of the revolution, dechristianization begins in Paris, but is spread throughout France's 83 departments by representatives on mission, those delegates who are sent out to enforce revolutionary policy. In each department, the de-Christianization process takes on the character of its own particular representative on mission. In some cases, it's orderly. Bands of political operatives may, for example, be sent out to remove all Christian imagery from local cemeteries, and towns and streets with religious-sounding names may be renamed to something more revolutionary. In other departments... Dechristianization is left up to the army. Troops may be sent to churches to smash all the statues and break the stained glass windows. 
In one case, soldiers parade an upside-down crucifix around town and force people to spit on it at gunpoint, which is an inversion of the traditional practice of kissing a crucifix. Simon Shama writes, quote, The churches themselves were often stripped of all sacerdotal objects. There were, in any case, urgent practical reasons for this despoliation. Church bells were needed for arms foundries, gold and silver for the Republic's treasury, though a great deal of the latter certainly found its way into the pockets of the de-Christianizers. But there was also pure vandalism on a massive scale. Altarpieces were slashed, stained glass windows broken. In Ampelpuy, in the Haute Beaujolais, a liberty tree replaced the crucifix in the crossing of the church. In many other places, devotional manuals and hymnals were burned in great bonfires, together with the plaster and wood saints found on every road crossing, crackling and melting in the flames like inanimate victims of an auto de fe. End quote. Like the terror, dechristianization has its opponents. Maximilien Robespierre is against it from the get go believing that religion is necessary to the creation of a virtuous republic. In a speech to the convention on November 21st, he says, quote, Every philosopher and every individual may adopt whatever opinion he pleases about atheism. Anyone who wishes to make such an opinion a crime is absurd. But the public man or the legislator who should adopt such a system would be a hundred times more foolish still. Atheism is aristocratic. The idea of a great being who watches over oppressed innocence and punishes triumphant crime is essentially the idea of the people. This is the sentiment of Europe and the world. It is the sentiment of the French people. The notion is attached neither to priests nor to superstition nor to ceremonies. It is attached only to the idea of an incomprehensible power, the terror of wrongdoers, the stay and comfort of virtue. End quote. Georges Danton is also opposed to dechristianization and views it as antithetical to a free republic where the majority of people are sincere Catholics. But Danton is still away in semi retirement when the policy is implemented, so for now, Hibert gets to have his way. In place of Christianity, Hibert establishes a new quasi-religion called the Cult of Reason. I say quasi-religion because it's never fully established and it's never fully approved by the National Convention, but nonetheless it is a thing. The Cult of Reason replaces Christian teachings with the teachings of the Revolution. Ideas like freedom, rationality, and the brotherhood of man are at its forefront. Churches are stripped of Christian imagery and rebranded as temples of reason. The Catholic saints, always popular in France, are replaced with revolutionary saints, people like Marat, who have spilled their own blood for the Republic. The cult of reason reaches its apotheosis on November 10, 1793, or the 20th of Brumaire, year 2, in a nationwide event called the Festival of Reason. Ceremonies are held in every major city, but the most famous of these is the Paris Festival, which is held in the Notre Dame Cathedral. The cathedral has been defaced. The famous statues of the kings of Israel have been beheaded in a symbolic execution of the old religion. And the words to philosophy have been chiseled into the stone over the main doors. On the altar is a woman robed in a red, white, and blue tricolor flag, holding a spear and wearing a revolutionary Phrygian cap. She represents the goddess of reason, and next to her is a flame representing the truth. We'll leave the city of Paris here, with its bizarre new religious cult and its piles of severed heads. We'll get back to them in the next episode, but 
For all of its excesses, the French Revolution does get some things right. And if we're going to be objective about it, we need to look at all of its aspects. And what I'm talking about here is slavery, which the National Convention will abolish in early 1794. Now, this episode is far too long already, and I could do a whole separate episode just on the revolution in the French colonies. As it stands, I've chosen to focus on France proper, so I hope you'll forgive me for relegating the colonies to a short summary. Slavery in the French colonies is as firmly established as it is in the Spanish Caribbean and the American South. In some ways, it's more established, uh, such as the existence of elaborate racial hierarchies. In Saint-Domingue, modern-day Haiti, the French have devised a caste system that would embarrass the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. There are designations for people who are half-black, one-quarter black, one-quarter one white, and so on, all the way out to one-sixty-fourth white or black. So they're tracking everyone's racial ancestry down to the eighth generation. Times being what they are, the whiter you are, the higher you rank on the hierarchy, and vice versa. The treatment of slaves in French colonies has been codified since 1685, when King Louis XIV promulgated the Code Noir, meaning literally the Black Code. This code is fairly brutal to modernize, but less severe than conditions in most Spanish colonies or in the American South. For example, slaves are to be treated as property, can be beaten and punished, and are to be executed if they assault their masters. But they also have the right to marry, with their master's permission, cannot be tortured or maimed, must be fed and housed to a certain minimum standard, and can sue if they are not, and if they're liberated, they immediately become French citizens with all the rights of citizenship. Along the same lines, the liberation of French slaves is a bit of a mixed bag. In the colonies, popular opinion turns in favor of liberation not because of revolutionary principles, but primarily because of political necessity. A huge slave rebellion has broken out in Saint-Domingue. And now, in late 1793, the colony is also being blockaded by the British and attacked via land from neighboring Santo Domingo, the modern-day Dominican Republic. Unable to simultaneously beat back outside attack and battle an internal slave rebellion, the colony's governors have gradually adopted a policy of liberation first for slaves who volunteer to fight the invaders, and then for all slaves. Basically, they hope to defang the slave rebellion by saying, okay guys, you won, you're all full citizens, now let's band together and fight the Spanish. This is only partially effective. Not all slaves will give up the rebellion, and in 1804, under commander Jean-Jacques Dessalines, Haiti will win its independence, culminating in a massacre of most of the white French citizens still living on the island. Dessalines will establish a new plantation system to build up the Haitian economy, and with most of the white people dead, all black citizens will be required to either serve in the army or work on plantations at gunpoint if necessary, which sounds suspiciously like slavery. It's no surprise, then, that Dessalines is soon overthrown in a coup, but that's a story for another day. And in other French colonies, the policy of slave liberation is more successful. It wouldn't be fair, though, to write off French abolitionism as mere self-interest on the part of desperate colonists. Many in the French government, Robespierre among them, are ardent abolitionists and have spoken and written about it for years. 
On February 4, 1794, the National Convention will vote to abolish slavery in all French colonies, make all freed slaves French citizens, and provide financial compensation to former slaveholders. Symbolically, this measure is passed by acclamation, which prevents any kind of long debate or long-winded speeches. They just want to get it done. It seems like forever ago, but earlier in this episode, I promised I'd get back to the war in the Vendée and finish that story. Where we left off, the Vendée rebels had just suffered a major defeat at the Battle of Nantes. Jacques Catalano, the larger-than-life former smuggler who had led the Catholic and Royal Army, had been killed. The other major leader we talked about, François de Charette, the nobleman who had tried to hide under his bed and had been coaxed into fighting the rebels, well, he's now subordinated himself to another major leader we didn't talk about, Henri de la roche Jacqueline, who leads the Catholic and Royal Army to a few more major victories. But roche Jacqueline is only 21 years old. While he's charismatic and brave, he lacks military experience and ends up leading the rebels into some costly defeats as well. One of the most notable is the Battle of Luçon, fought between July 15th and August 14th, 1793. It's not so much a battle as a series of skirmishes where the two sides go back and forth attacking each other, but it plays to the Republican army's strengths. They are a proper army with troops who are paid for their jobs and a designated supply train. The Catholic and Royal Army, on the other hand, is made up of peasant militiamen. The people who serve in the army are the same people who provide food and supplies, so guys keep going home to their farms and returning to the army, but over time, more and more men keep leaving and fewer and fewer are coming back, and eventually, Roche Jacqueline is forced to retreat. After another defeat at Cholet on October 17th, the Catholic and Royal Army is split. François de Charette goes south, deep into the Vendée, to fight a guerrilla war with around 10,000 men. Roche Jacqueline goes north across the Loire River to try and reach the Normandy coast and get help from the British, maybe even establish a beachhead where the Royal Navy can land some troops. But the Republican army keeps attacking him, and while he's able to win a few engagements, this kind of war of attrition just doesn't favor a peasant army. Again, the force just keeps getting smaller and smaller over time because these guys aren't professional soldiers and somebody needs to do the farming or everyone's going to starve. After another major defeat on December 23rd, the main body of the Catholic and Royal Army is completely dispersed, and Roche Jacqueline is forced to go into hiding disguised as a peasant. He tries to conduct a guerrilla war, but is shot and killed in January of 1794. From there on out, the Catholic and Royal Army ceases to exist as an ordinary fighting force, and becomes strictly a guerrilla army led primarily by François de Charette, but also by others, including a former Swiss guard named Jean-Nicolas Stoufflet. Now, I don't want to get into a blow-by-blow -blow account because it's confusing and this is already a long episode. But Charette and Stoufflet managed to give the Republicans such a headache that the revolutionary government agrees to peace terms in February of 1795. Michael Davies writes, quote, The Republic made concession after concession. There was to be complete freedom of worship. Non-juring priests would not be molested in any way. Confiscated property would be returned, and a huge indemnity paid by the government. Order would be maintained not by the hated blues, but by a guard of Vendeans. Charette accepted the proposals and entered Nantes in triumph. 
He even managed to assemble a military band to play his veterans in. The royalist general wore a blue jacket, an ornate scapular, a broad white belt ornamented with fleur-de-lis, and a hat with a huge white plume. Cannon were fired to salute him. Church bells rang out, and the enormous crowd cried, Vive Charette! Vive le Paix! Vive le Roi! Stoffle, alas, was furious at Charette's acceptance of the Republican terms. He did not hesitate to speak of traitors and continued with the armed conflict. But on May 5, 1795, Stoffle felt that he had no alternative but to sign the peace agreement. He could not realistically continue the war alone. Celebrations were organized in every village. There were banquets, processions, and music. Non-juring priests came out of hiding to celebrate mass for their people in daylight. Officers from the Blues came to join in the celebrations. It seemed that peace had come at last, but the peace was no more than superficial. Republican families who returned to their homes were, not surprisingly, greeted with great hostility. The agreement that Republican forces should leave the Vendée and allow it to be policed by Vendéans was broken. The Republican forces, far from being reduced, were reinforced. The promised indemnities were not paid. Vendéans spontaneously took up their arms again. Republican convoys were ambushed, and the peasants began once more to build up supplies of powder and shot. End quote. François de Charette and Jean-Nicolas Stoffle both take to the field again, along with other Vendéan leaders, and the Catholic and Royal Army has one last hurrah at the Battle of Quiberon in late June through mid-July of 1795. There, a bunch of French émigrés have decided to invade France from the west, and they're landing on the south coast of Brittany, France's Atlantic coast, because the Republican army is prepared for a naval attack over the English Channel, and the Atlantic coast is relatively undefended by comparison. Brittany is also close to the Vendée, and the Catholic and Royal Army prepares a beachhead for them to land, while the British Royal Navy provides a transport fleet. While the landing is a success, the ensuing fight is a complete failure. While the émigrés and Vendéans outnumber the local Republican forces by a wide margin, there's no unified command, and the army acts as a bunch of separate, uncoordinated forces. Uh, just for example, among the Vendéans, uh, François de Charette has sworn loyalty to the Count of Artois, future King Charles X, while Stoffle has sworn loyalty to the Count of Provence, future King Louis XVIII. After being promised safe passage by the Republicans, the émigré army surrenders, and the Republican army reneges on their promise of safe passage almost immediately, executing 750 of the 6,000 surrendered troops. Just as a little footnote here, the Republican commander is a guy named Lazar Hoche, who was the National Guard commander who had saved Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette's lives during the Women's March on Versailles. Just another one of those apolitical military leaders who serves whoever happens to be running France at the time. Jean-Nicolas Stoffle and François de Charette are both captured and executed shortly thereafter. In February 1796 and March 1796, respectively. As an acknowledgement that they are military men, they are shot by firing squads rather than guillotined. This doesn't completely end Vendean resistance, uh, some of these guerrillas will keep fighting for another 20 years, but for our purposes, the war in the Vendée is basically over. The Republican army is successful in the Vendée not just because of its logistical and manpower advantages, but 
also because it implements terror policies of its own. French diplomat Jacques Villemin has analyzed the actions of the Republican army in the war in the Vendée and has come to the conclusion that the Republican army committed war crimes almost from the beginning of the uprising in March of 1793, that those war crimes escalated to crimes against humanity in the summer of 1793, and that from late summer 1793 to early summer 1794, the Republican army was engaged in a campaign of genocide. It's important to note that Villemin uses modern international law to make this analysis and that no such crimes had been defined in the late 18th century. Nevertheless, I should clarify what each of these things means. War crimes are crimes of individual soldiers. So, for example, if in the heat of the moment a Republican army soldier shoots a surrendering Vendean rebel, that's a war crime. It attaches to the individual, not to the state. Crimes against humanity are war crimes that are committed as a matter of policy. So if a Republican army commander orders his men to burn down an entire village, that's a crime against humanity. And this is done all the time in order to discourage Vendean peasants from going to war in the first place. If a Republican army unit comes across a farm and finds only women and children, they will assume that the man is off at war and burn the entire farm. And this is effective. It's one of the reasons the Catholic and Royal Army has trouble keeping men in the field later in the rebellion. These guys aren't just scared for their lives. They're worried that their farms will be burned in their absence and their wives and children will starve. That's a pretty strong incentive to stay home and not get involved. The most serious charge, though, is genocide, which the United Nations defines as, quote, a crime committed with the intent to destroy a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group in whole or in part, end quote. To understand why the Republican reprisals in the Vendée might be considered genocide, when nobody talks about the rest of the reign of terror being a genocide, we have to talk about two things. First, According to Villemin's methodology, the Vendean rebels existed both as a social group, peasants, and as a religious group, Catholics who retained their allegiance to the traditional church and not to juring priests. If the Republican army attempted to destroy them, this would indeed count as genocide. By contrast, a country executing thousands of its own citizens, even very many citizens, uh, it's tough to call that genocide because you can't commit genocide against yourself. Well, this brings up the second thing we have to talk about, which is, did the Republican Army, in fact, attempt to destroy the Vendeans as a people? Well, in August and October of 1793, the National Convention votes to establish an army group to destroy the brigands south of the Loire River. This group consists of 12 troop columns that come to be known as the Infernal Columns and are led by a man named Louis-Marie Thoreau. Thoreau is an unremarkable general known only for his leadership of the Infernal Columns, but his description of his plans to the National Convention is revealing. He says he intends to, quote, "...burn everything, to leave nothing but what is essential to establish the necessary quarters for exterminating the rebels." End quote. This is exactly what the Infernal Columns do. They burn crops and murder entire villages suspected of harboring rebels. And their actions over the first half of 1794 are a big reason why Francois de Charette comes to the negotiating table. 
In his book, The Terror, The Shadow of the Guillotine, France, 1792 through 1794, English writer Graham Fife describes one incident just north of the Vendée, near the end of one purge of a rebellious town. He writes, quote, On February 23rd, the coaster Destin, moored at Pambouf, a town on the left bank of the Loire, 11 kilometers from the mouth, took on board 24 women, 10 children, aged 5 to 10 years, five babies at the breast, two men of whom one was blind and nearly 80 years old, all supposedly insurgents. The aim was, supposedly, to take them upstream to Nantes, but the captain had an order written by the adjutant general, Lefebvre, and countersigned by Foucault, a Marat present at most of the drownings. Once out at sea, the live cargo was pushed overboard as rebels, outlaws. Who could have given such an order? At his trial, Foucault claimed that, as for himself, he had only ever obeyed the orders of a superior. End quote. If this argument reminds you of another group of war criminals who said they were just following orders, you're not alone. And if you're curious about numbers, French historian Renald Sechet gives a good analysis. His analysis of pre-war and post-war population numbers shows a decrease of 14.38% in the greater Vendée area. Of course, some towns are hit harder than others. The town of Pembouf, where all those people were drowned, shows a population loss of more than 39%. Property losses were even greater across the Greater Vendée, with more than 10,000 houses burned, or just over 18% of the total housing units in that area. The issue of Vendéan genocide is controversial in France even today. Some historians view the infernal columns as indisputably genocidal, while Others view the war in the Vendée as a two-sided affair and argue that since some people in the Vendée supported the revolution, the revolutionary government's reprisals couldn't possibly have been genocidal. Others dispute the numbers of dead. For example, Reynald Sachet's numerical analysis depends on total population numbers, and we know that many people weren't killed but left the Vendée as refugees. That sounds reasonable until you ask yourself how many of those refugees had lost family members or left because their homes had been burned down. It's impossible to say, but it's clear that the numbers alone don't tell the whole story. Regardless of whether we're talking about a full-blown genocide, we're at least looking at crimes against humanity on a vast scale, committed in the name of liberty, equality, and Republican government. The war in the Vendée will go on to inspire future generations of counter-revolutionaries. 200 years after its outbreak in 1993, Soviet dissident Alexander Solzhenitsyn would visit the Vendée and give a speech saying, quote, That revolution brings out instincts of primordial barbarism, the sinister forces of envy, greed, and hatred. This even its contemporaries could see all too well. They paid a terrible enough price for the mass psychosis of the day, when merely moderate behavior, or even the perception of such, already appeared to be a crime. As half centuries and centuries have passed, people have learned from their own misfortunes that revolutions demolish the organic structures of society, disrupt the natural flow of life, destroy the best elements of the population, and give free reign to the worst. That a revolution never brings prosperity to a nation, but benefits only a few shameless opportunists, 
while to the country as a whole, it heralds countless deaths, widespread impoverishment, and, in the gravest cases, a long-lasting degeneration of the people. End quote. The story of the Vendée rebels finally ends with a sort of historical coda. Not long after the French Revolution dies down, Emperor Napoleon will praise the Catholic and Royal Army and would call François de Charette a military genius. Then, in 1815, when Napoleon returns from exile to try and retake France, the region will remain loyal to King Louis XVIII, and the old Vendean armies will rise again. This forces Napoleon to divert 10,000 troops to deal with the uprising. And while those troops are successful, their absence may very well be the decisive factor at the Battle of Waterloo, a battle decided only by the narrowest of margins. If this is the case, then the Vendée rebels end up getting the last laugh. After all, they get their king back. In the next episode, the revolution's chickens come home to roost. One by one, several leading figures will exit the stage at the hand of Madame Guillotine. The reign of terror will kill thousands and will provoke a counter-revolution that puts the Paris mob in its place and restores a semblance of truly national government before a flurry of coups and counter-coups puts an end to democratic rule. On the war front, the levée en masse pays off in a big way, with French armies defeating a series of attacks by the members of the First Coalition. And in the background, a certain Corsican artillery commander prepares to take center stage. All that and more in the next episode of Relevant History. Hello again, it's Dan, here to remind you that a Relevant History Patreon subscription now only costs $1 a month. So if you've been on the fence about subscribing, now is a great opportunity to get access to all 24 episodes of my video series, Dan's War College, along with the Relevant History Discord channel where you can chat with me and other patrons. Access to the Discord will remain $1 indefinitely, but access to Dan's War College is for a limited time only. Once I get back to recording new episodes, only $5 patrons will have access. So get in now while the offer's still good. Link in the description. If you just want to read the occasional show update as well as random blurbs about sports and politics and whatever else is on my mind, you can find me on X, uh, better known as the app formerly known as Twitter, at at Dan Toller Podcast. That's at Dan T-O-L-E-R Podcast. If you want to correct an error, request an interview, or just say hi, you can reach me at dantollerpodcast at gmail.com. That's dan, T-O-L-E-R, podcast at gmail.com. You can find other links, including some past interviews at dantollerpodcast.com. That's dan, T-O-L-E-R, podcast.com. Finally, sharing an episode with your friends is the best way to help the show and grow the audience. So if you like what you're hearing, please give Relevant History a shout out on social media, Reddit, or wherever else you hang out online. It makes a big difference. And best of all, sharing is totally free. Thanks for listening.